What does he think a co-op means? Please get to this. Econo boy, you dumb fuck. Drill down. Hey, what? Oh no! Wait, I don't think Vosh knows anything about the structure of businesses. He must know this. I would be so sad if Vosh didn't know what a cooperative was. That when you make risk quotation marks. God, his audience is so is so fucking white, wealthy, and fucking gated community living. Oh god, it drives me crazy. Vosh, I thought you were better than this. Fuck. He needs it's because he stopped debating for so long. Nobody's challenged him or pushed him on any of these issues. This is why I said this and Vosh's community got mad at me and they made fun of me and they said I was an idiot. Market socialists are just capitalists, guys. Cute though, Vosh is trying to challenge himself with conversations again. That's good. Easing himself back in slowly. Um, the first debate, most of it was relatively positive, um, but the one consistent piece of advice was that I need to be more aggressive. Um, so if you if you will, uh, just can you give me a second? I just want to yell at you uh, for maybe 20 seconds to, yeah, to give the it. people what they want. Hit me up. Okay, okay, okay. I've been working on this. <sighs> okay, okay. A little nervous. Okay, boss, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Okay, that was one. Mm -hmm. I've got two more. Okay. Uh, you're so fucking stupid that if you were born in the 1930s, you would have been lobotomized by your parents. All right, that was the second one. It's good, it's good. Um, okay, and I've got the third one. The third one's, okay, just don't get triggered by the third one, okay? Okay. The third one, you, sir, are not very good at Metroid. Uh, we, were, uh, we were doing some, some research then before the, uh, yeah. the conversation. Just a little bit, just a little bit. I, I, I did, you know, I posted to your, um, I posted to your subreddit uh, about the debate coming up, this one today. And someone said that I can't possibly win because of my rampant idealism. Mm -hmm. And so I should debate you dialectically, materially uh, to, to stand a chance. Uh, what do you think of that advice? I think that uh, that would be an unwinnable position from your end because the economy is not real in a dialectically materialist sense. Um, it's an idea. Okay. So it's pretty much, it's pr pretty much uh, hmm. just uh, over and done with right out the gate. Economics itself is idealism. Mm -hmm. I, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but all right. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. So I guess if you if you want to go ahead and get started, I've got questions. I've got little. I've got a little frame for way for for how this can go. Um, if if you want to. If you want to start there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with regards to worker cooperatives, of which I seem to be one of the more vocal advocates online, uh, I think that it would be good if we not only changed uh, existing laws in order to either subsidize or incentivize the creation of new worker cooperatives, and there are a number of ways in which you can do this, from tax incentives to preferential loans to a, a tremendous number of ways you can approach that. Um, and I think that uh, more research should be done in that particular field uh, because my my dream would be a worker cooperative economy, one in which private ownership of any company is illegal, at least past a certain size, uh, if you have one or two people. Okay. No, never mind. Sorry. People doing a startup, it seems a little unwieldy to have a government mandated uh, democratic threshold that you have to meet. Uh, that seems like it'd be very difficult to legislate. But past a certain size, I think it's reasonable to aim for the goal of a completely cooperative economy. I was going to say, why not do these loans ourselves? Why not start loaning out money to people? My guess, to start a restaurant, If you were loaning money to somebody to start a restaurant, my guess is like, it's less than $500,000 for sure. Maybe like $200,000 to start a restaurant. Do you think you'd need that much capital up front? I bet it'd be less than that, depending on the type of restaurant you do. It would also depend on, it would also depend on the location as well. It also depends on what you're buying. Are you buying all the equipment? 
I bet you could do it for less than like $150,000. But then you probably need some month's worth of salaries. Restaurants are terrible investments, aren't they? They fell the time. Well, what other business would you start as a co-op? In New York City, way higher? Thanks, dude. Yeah, because that's what I'm talking about. Let's start a restaurant the most with the most expensive fucking real estate in the world. <clears throat> you can start a taco truck for 2K. Oh, true. Let's get the Bank of Vosh. The Socialist Bank of Vosh. The SBV. Let's get this out here. Let's start loaning money for these co-ops. Let's see if they work. <laughs> um, economically, I think that it's difficult to make a full case for the effectiveness of this because we just have so little data. We know that worker cooperatives are effective in many respects at a small level, um, though in some fields, they, in terms of economics, perform equally well to traditionally run firms. In some, they seem to exceed in some margins. Workers seem to be a bit happier. In larger firms, I mean, I'm talking like transnational corporations, um, I'd be interested in seeing how a worker cooperative model could be applied to that. I imagine this project, this experiment, could take a very long time um, as it should, because it's important to gather good data on that sort of thing. Uh, and to finish, the truth Thank is, you, though, Steven. I talk about economic productivity, but the reality of this is that I really don't give a shit whether or not worker cooperatives are more effective or efficient than... Uh, wow, hold on. Now, this is exciting, okay? This is exciting, and I can't wait to get into this. But let's take a quick micro segue into... Um, we had more exciting videos open. Let me just check a couple of these things real quick. Traditionally run firms. In fact, they could be less effective um, than traditionally run <clears throat> firms, and I would still advocate for them for political reasons, if not economic reasons. For the same reason that even if you presented me data proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that an authoritarian government is more effective at quick decision making than a democratic government, I would still favor democracy in any situation because I think the ability to control the systems in which you live is just a fundamental um, right humans should have access to. Wow. Thank you, Vash. Okay. And so you've, you've kind of answered some of the questions that I figured uh, I would start out with. So mm -hmm. market socialism, I guess to you is basically a cooperative, you know, worker cooperatives, essentially. Like if you, well, not that that's the only way that market wor worker or not so that that's the only way that market socialism is coming into being, but basically your version of market socialism Miss is, you know, when 95% of businesses are worker cooperatives, it sounds like. Yeah, ideally. I, I think that there are a number of ways to approach it, but the abolition of the bourgeois <clears throat> is, is a necessary prerequisite. That's one effective way of doing it. Okay, and... That makes some sense. And you feel like even if the data could show you that worker cooperatives are uh, demonstrably sort of worse than traditional firms, you would still advocate for them because principally you think that basically worker democracy is, is kind of an a priori issue. Yes. If they were so much worse, I mean, so categorically ineffective um, that... It, 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 trying to implement that model would lead to like civilizational collapse or would reduce the standard of living so drastically that you would actually get more benefits from authoritarianism across the board. You know, if democracy truly could not function, then I would be willing to consider, uh, you know, compromises in that respect. But Thank thankfully, you, the data doesn't seem to indicate that worker cooperatives are anywhere near that ineffective. Um, or at least we'd need more data to find out if they are. Yeah. Um, so... I think that in general, my position on this would be that I think incentives are good. Um, I don't know of anybody who's sort of inherent. I don't know of anybody who has some sort of intrinsic opposition to worker cooperatives, to be fair. Um, I mean, even like a, I don't see even why like a conservative would have a problem with people voluntarily forming a worker cooperative mm -hmm. unless they have unless they're just kind of weird. Um, okay. And I think most people could also get on board with incentives. I think that, however, two things with regard to incentives and then with regard to the future economy where you're sort of mandated to be cooperatives. Um, I think that with regard to incentives, I don't actually think they would be that effective at transforming the economy to be um, even close to entirely worker cooperatives. I don't think that would be enough. A mandate would get you there, but I think that a mandate has so many structural problems that um, I could... I, I, I could conceive of a society where a worker cooperatively sort of mandated economy is actually a fair bit worse than our current economy. And uh, the third thing that I would say is that uh, what, I, what I would say from a sort of 
a more capitalist or social democratic perspective is that um, democracy in the workplace isn't even necessarily a bad idea. I mean, the idea of a collaborative, sort of uh, more committee-oriented workplace uh, is fine, uh, but I think there's actually better ways to implement democratic structures in the workplace than necessarily some sort of cooperative mandate. Um, and I think there's good ways to implement those things that are alternative to uh, or in addition to uh, worker cooperative incentives that I think would be advantageous uh, and ultimately better than some sort of a, you know, a, a more strict uh, mandated system. Better to what end? Well, I mean, better to the end of uh, economic growth is one thing, right? Better for economic growth. I think also ultimately better for the workers as well, right? I mean, I, I, obviously, I think you would agree that, you know, there's there's a lot of workers who uh, maybe wouldn't necessarily want to be uh, the owners of their business, right? There's there's risks associated with being a worker, sure, but there's additional sort of uh, unique risks that are associated with being the owner of a business. Um, and that's not to mention that, you know, forget about the sort of, you know, uh, well, it, it really comes back. Oh, to I was just wondering how mad Vosher's community is when they hear the story. There is no risks to being a business owner. Um, okay, real quick. Um, let's let's talk real, real, just super ultra. Wait, oh, my mic's on. Okay, sorry. Um, super ultra quick. Uh, talk about business owning, that, that structure in the United States, okay? People think that in the U.S., the average business owner is worth about 1 billion USD, makes about two to $3,000 an hour, and has slaves. This is like the average business owner in the United States, okay? Is is like a little bit more poor than Elon Musk, okay? That's like the average business owner in the United States, okay? <clears throat> in reality, the vast majority of business owners, out. Oh, actually, is there a stat on this? It would be cool if I just had like data. Um, median wage business, or median total compensation? Median, what would I find? Median pay? Business owner, United States. Uh, the salaries of small business owners in the U.S. range from 30000 to 160000 A salary doesn't get you everything because they're making a little bit more money based on what the business makes. Oh, wait. Well, include... No, okay, hold on, never mind. Included in those numbers are businesses, profit sharing, and commissions. So this... Actually, I think this is the total compensation on the net income. So, okay. So... This is even lower than I thought it was. So the the average business owner salary is fifty nine thousand dollars per year, assuming that it is indeed taking into account the profit scraped from the business as well, right? The average business owner is working a lot, like 60, 70 hours a week because they're working all the time on their small business. They're not making that much money. And oftentimes, like their entire life is wrapped up in that business, okay? Um, the idea that like a business owner is like a fat cat that's making fuck ton of money, that's just not true. If you ever wanna test this theory in real life, go walk down to any small businesses and then go in and be like, hey, when is the owner here? And everybody will say like, yeah, he's here like Monday through Saturday, you know, like he'll be here at like 8 a.m. and he probably loses six or seven. Like they'll be there. The owner will be there for you to talk to them. They're in all the time. Or they're out doing other stuff peripheral related to the business. Um, <clears throat> okay. I just, I just want you to be aware now, I'm not making any moral arguments. I'm not saying that like they deserve to do that or fuck workers or blah, blah, blah. I'm not trying to say any of that, okay? All I'm saying is that the average business owner is not some fat cat, ultra wealthy person um, that can lose, you know, uh, you know, I lost four businesses. <laughs> Who the fuck cares? I'm a business owner, I'm rich. That's not the average business owner, okay? In the United States of America. Um. My friend's dad bought a Dairy Queen franchise and instantly got a Ferrari. Some might be richer than others, but. <clears throat> um, small business failure rates are extremely high as well. Correct. In 2019, the failure rate of startups was around 90%. Research concludes that 21.5% of startups fail in the first year, 30% in the second year, 50% in the fifth year, and 70% in their 10th year. Um, okay. If I start a bakery or something, is that considered a startup? Yeah. I mean, assuming that you like start a bakery, yeah. I'm sorry, but I see like in chat, I see his chat is already getting asked, Matt, at this point it's being brought up. Here we go again. <clears throat> oh no, this talking point. No. Yeah. The investment risk is one thing, sure, but... 
um, you know, the, the, there's the sort of employment risk as an owner. That's one thing, sure. Um, but that, that same risk sort of applies with a, uh, a worker as well. But there's sort of credit and financial risks that don't exist for, uh, you know, workers that exist for owners. And I think that when you make risk quotation marks, God, his audience is so is so fucking white, wealthy and fucking gated community living. Oh, God, it drives me crazy. Just go walk down and, and walk through some old, small business. And just like you can ask for the owner. They'll be there. You don't even have to ask for the manager. I would say I want to I want to talk to the owner. OK, like a worker. Unlike uh, DGG, we never do knee jerk reactions. <laughs> True. God damn it. My community is the most free-thinking, independent-minded, free-spirited, educated fan base of Chad Gigachads on the internet. Absolutely. Necessarily be invested uh, several hundred thousand dollars into one single business. I mean, that's just, you know, that, that sort of flies in the face of relatively standard financial advice, right? This is why I dislike sock dems. What if you're only one member of a collectively who shares those financial risks? Nah, I work in a 500 employee company. There would only be gains. Bro, 500 employee company is a huge company, okay? If you've made it, fuck. Does anybody have no links to these numbers? This is just my, my, my intuitive guess. If you have a small business and you employ 50 workers, you're like cream of the crop, like you're making it. 500, or, or I'm sorry, 50 employees, like full-time employment in a business, that's like a, you, you're like getting there. That's like a medium size, like, that's like impressive. <clears throat> Which is like, you don't want to invest like almost all your net worth into a single business. And I think that in a worker cooperative sort of mandated economy, you're requiring workers to do that. And you know, they simply might just not want to, right? I think that would be fine. That would be a fine choice for them to make. Especially LLC takes away financial risk, doesn't it? What? Listen, chat, you take risk with... I'm sorry, I should stop reading his chat. Damn, these people are stupid. Listen, chat, you take risk with work potential. Imagine if your crop didn't work out and everyone dies. Yeah, financial risk. That's just like the risk of starving. <laughs> okay. Under my framework, which is uh, more flexible, but also includes a lot of sort of protections for workers that I think are fairly robust. I don't know what additional risk there would be. In a worker cooperative economy... If you want to join with a place and you pass some minimal probationary period and you become a member, I don't know why you would need to rely on an investment of hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so. The same amount. Wait. He must know what a worker cooperative is, right? In order to join a cooperative, you would necessarily need some big um, financial like contribution to own whatever percentage share of the company you need. You have to buy into it. That's why it's a cooperative, right? Am I misunderstanding? Also, are all these things gonna go in my shell? They should be, right? I'm so paranoid of them not working. The amount of money is there presently, conceptually, in an economy which is democratically owned or traditionally owned. Um, I don't know why you would need to incur any more of a risk as an owner. As a worker, we know that- uh, Wait, hold on, real quick. Someone in chat said this. Destiny, my company has 220 employees and we have a revenue of over a billion dollars, a profit about a hundred million dollars. The size of a company doesn't have to be that big to have huge dollar amounts tied to it. Um, kind of. What I'm trying to say is people in their head don't know what a big company is or what a successful company is. If you have a company with 220 employees, that is a big business. Like that's a that's a really good size business. Like, like I said, like once you get past like, even getting to like 10 full-time employees is a really big deal. But once you hit like 50, you're like on your way. Like that's really positive. Like over 200, that's a big business. Uh, people in their mind today are like, oh, like big business, probably like 50,000 employees, I guess, or whatever, you know, a small business. I guess if you have like less than a thousand employees, like maybe 800 is like a pretty small business like that. I'm trying to agree with you. No, I know you are. I'm just saying that like 200 employees, that's a big, that's a that's a pretty big company, I think, that you're, you're doing really well. <clears throat> There are plenty of perils you face in the job market. The job, the possibility of losing your job suddenly, uh, which can happen essentially at any time with no severance um, in the States, at least in, in, in a great many fields, um, fired without cause. Um, you can travel for a job that gives way underneath your feet very quickly. I just, I don't know what additional risk you would incur. And I don't think it's- The capital investment, Vosh, it's a co-op. What do you mean? You've got to bring money to the table to join. You have to buy in. If you're, if you're truly working in a cooperative, 
Do you guys don't understand what a cooperative is? Do I need to explain this? If you're truly working in a cooperative, you need to be bringing some money to the table because you're getting a share, you're getting some ownership in the company. Destiny, the startup I work for has only raised one round and has 300 employees. It's only raised Series A and is going for Series B. At least in startups, that's not considered big. 300 employee company is pretty big. Like, what? Like, what is the average tech startup in like San Francisco? It's got to be like fucking 10 employees or less. No, like the the average startup. Like, I'm I'm so curious. Who, who, where are my tech guys? Like, I feel like I've heard of people moving. Nicole did it. Blue Tea, I think she moved to go like work at a startup in San Francisco, and that company was like seven people. Like, I don't think you can say you have a startup with 300 employees. That's fucking huge. Wait, what? I don't believe. I don't believe you. But maybe you are. I'm sorry. I, I'm also talking on my ass a little bit. I'm relying heavily on anecdote here. Maybe, maybe you're different. But maybe, or maybe it's a different type of field that you're in or something. But something workers should have a choice to. I don't think they should have the freedom to not be free. We don't give people, after all, the opportunity to sell their ability to vote. Yeah, shit. Hold on. I'm sorry, fuck. I have to keep qualifying what I'm saying. Everything that I'm saying is kind of related to, like, tech or maybe some, like, small businesses that sell, like, some services. There might be other industries that do start, and they're actually way bigger, like, as a startup. Like, maybe, and I'm just spitballing here because I don't know, but maybe for, like, agriculture, there is no such thing as, like, a seven-employee business. Maybe agriculture businesses always have, like, 100 um, employees minimum. I'm, I'm probably really biased towards, like, tech startups is what I'm thinking of. So that is that is possible. I, I, I'm, I, just, I, I don't know 100%. Yeah. In federal elections, right? True. If we did, we could imagine that would be quite destructive. I bet many people would if they could. <clears throat> if you could offer a person $10,000 and they could never vote again, but instead, like, uh, the person who bought the vote from them could vote in their stead. You can imagine situations where, you know, conglomerates would buy up thousands or millions of votes to sway local and federal elections massively. I think there were significant consequences to allowing people um, the ability to opt out of democracy, even if it's something they don't want necessarily. Well, I think the issue is that, you know, we can have democracy in the workplace, but um, I think that when you tie democracy and democratic structures to ownership, that's when you run into economic problems, right? So, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, why, why would you need a huge investment in the business? Well, if you're going to, obviously, if you're going to own a business, right, you have to buy equity in that business. Um, and I think that, under a lot yes. of socialist type frameworks, I think that ownership without equity seems it's not real. Uh, well, it's it seems like a you know an oxymoron almost, yes. right? You 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 do have to invest some sort of capital into the business. Otherwise, you know what would what would starting businesses look like? What would what would selling businesses look like? Mm -hmm. um, would that even be possible? I'm not sure, honestly. But um, in general, though, if if we assume that. Uh, if we assume that a market socialist society can maintain to at least some some uh, reasonable degree the wealth of today's society, uh, then it would necessarily be the case that workers would be heavily invested in the businesses that they work in. You might say that that's a good thing. All that I would say is that's a structural barrier for a lot of people. Yes. Um, and I think that also that's a reasonable choice that people might not want to make. It's not that people wouldn't necessarily be listened to under my system. I think worker board membership is a great policy. I think unionization is a great policy. Um, I think a robust welfare state is a great policy. I think in a system where you have a robust welfare state, pretty you know ubiquitous unionization and uh, mandatory worker uh, board membership, sort of that democratic, you know, you know, democracy in the workplace, basically. Um, I don't really see why it's necessarily the case that we would have to make all businesses cooperatives, I unless, uh, of course, just as an FYI, um, <laughs> um, and you can maybe this is me being a little bad faith. I don't think it is. Um, Vosh has held on to this like market socialism like worker cooperatives are the solution to everything point for i think his entire internet existence i don't think he will ever be moved off this point no matter how dog shit ultimately it ends up being i think it is impossible to move him off of this point also do you think your ray receivers do they receive less energy if they are um if the planet is farther away from the sun sort of tied to that idea of socialism, you know, my system might not be considered socialist, whereas yours would be. But I'm, you know, I'm not sure that that's a system that's necessarily better for the workers. Yes, okay. I am tied to that idea. Uh, if we're limiting our discussion exclusively to what looks better in a GDP chart, then we would continue with neoliberalism until the planet burned. But there are broader considerations. 
you know, nobody, like, smashed graphs together to figure out whether or not it was worthwhile to give people the vote. Uh, it's something you fight for as a matter of principle. And I, I wish that Vosh would be... Okay. I'm not gonna, I'm try, I don't want to be unreasonably critical of Vosh, but I think that this is a little bit of a bad faith engagement with Econoboy. Econoboy is pretty smart. It's pretty stupid to argue that some economic system is better because it gives us bigger numbers on our GDP graph. Like, I don't think he's that stupid, right? That's something that I would say to somebody that I have, like, no intellectual respect for. Like, okay, good job, bro. You want to raise GDP. Like, let's actually, let's get real. Let's talk about the real economy, right? That seems kind of like a weird thing to just stick in there, but... I think there are direct downstream consequences of the economic authoritarianism we live under now. First of all, I just don't think there's any additional risk. Worker cooperatives already exist. You don't need to buy into them. It's a system in some countries. I Wait, think. what is he? Did... We're, I hope we're going to get into this. What does he think a cooperative is? Wait, hold on, wait. I, I don't know if chat knows what cooperatives are. Do I need to explain what a co-op is? Okay, hold on, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> if I start a business, typically you're going to have an ownership part of the business. So these are gonna be the actual people that own, meaning they like control the equity of, they can buy and sell the business. Um, these types of people are going to be part of like the owner part of the owner structure of the business. So say for destiny.gg LLC, I am the owner of my business, I own it. So if I wanted to sell that business, I would exclusively have the rights to do so. Um, if somebody wanted to start a cooperative, right? Well, hold on, let's do one more. Let's say that I wanted to sell half of my business to somebody, okay? Let's say that I do some calculations based on the overall revenue that my business makes, and I say, I think Destiny GG is worth, I'll say, I think my business is worth, um, we'll say $5 million, okay? Um, let's say that I want to sell um, half of my business to Dan, okay? And I'll, I'll value my company at $5 million. Dan will spend $2.5 million, and now he's a 50% owner. So now both of us are making decisions about the company. We both own it. If we want to sell it, I probably have to consult with him since we both have like half ownership, right? We have some equity in the business, half, both of us, right? In a cooperative environment, oh, and then let's say that from there, we could employ people. So employees are a cost of doing business. We pay some money to their labor. They work for us. They generate revenue. And then hopefully we make extra money from that revenue because revenue, less the cost of doing business, um, is going to be the profit that our business makes. Okay. So <clears throat> let's say that we want to do a cooperative instead. In a cooperative, there is no owner class. In a cooperative, all of the workers themselves own equity in the business. So if I have a business worth $5 million and I have five employees, each of those employees has $1 million in equity. But now the interesting part is, let's say that I have a business where five employees all own one share of the business and they all own $1 million worth of the business, right? So it's a $5 million business, five employees. If they wanna hire a new employee that's part of that cooperative, that employee needs to buy a share of that business so that he has an equal share in ownership to truly be a cooperative, right? So you can't just come work for us if we're a cooperative. We need to sell you a share of the business. All of us have to sell part of our equity to the business. We all owned one fifth of it before. Now we're all gonna decrease our ownership to one sixth and you're gonna buy in for one sixth. That's what a co-op is. So the difficulty in starting a co-op is that everybody needs to bring capital to the table to join, to truly be a cooperative owner, because they have to be able to buy in to whatever the worth of the business is. Um, that's what it means when it's like, so if I want to go work for McDonald's as a laborer, that's easy. I just have to sign up. Like, oh, can I work? I'm like, yeah, you can work. Okay, cool. I work there. I work at McDonald's now. But if I want to join a co-op, well, now I need to buy in. I need to pay money to join that because I'm actually getting equity in the business as a worker. That's what a cooperative means. Doesn't that make changing jobs hard as hell? Yes. That's what Econoboy is talking about when he says, well, there's added risk because here's a couple problems, okay? Are co-ops always equal ownership? No, you can have different structures of ownership if you want, but if you truly want a democratic workplace, a lot of these employees are gonna have to be able to fight. Like if you just have like, if it's not like a stock option plan or like, oh, you get like 10 stocks of Walmart because that's, then you're not really in a co-op anymore. Now you're back at traditional capital ownership, right? Um, the issue though is, so here's our, here's our problem. 
Let's say that I like, okay, well, I'm gonna start working for these guys. I'm bringing my $20,000 to the table and I'm gonna start working for this business now. I'm gonna buy my share. I get part share of the company. I can sell it if I want and now I'm working for them. Well, let's say that business goes out of business, okay? Fuck. If I work for a company and they go to business as a laborer, well, fuck you. I'm not selling my labor anymore. I walk away and I'm fine. But now if I work for a cooperative and they go out of business, my equity is now worth nothing and I just lost money. I might go to work for a place for a year and then that place goes under and I've lost money because I have, I've lost my, my, my share is not worth nothing because the business failed, you know? So this is a, um, it's, there's challenges here. Now, to be clear, I'm presenting you some of the, the challenges of running a cooperative. There could be some potential benefits too. Let's say that you go to work for a place, you buy in and now it doubles in size, right? Oh, cool. Well now, not only are you getting more money because you're working and hopefully the co-op is paying wages to all of the workers slash owners. Um, now also the value of your share has increased so you can like make money if you sell it down the line or something, right? But, I'm, th but there are challenges here, right? There's challenges to this. I don't know if Vosh is aware of what a cooperative is. Um, getting the power to vote, a democratic vote in a business, typically means you have some equity in the business and equity has to be bought into. He must know this. I would be so sad if Vosh didn't know what a cooperative was. What? I'm pretty sure you can't sell your co-op share, no? Um, you could, but you'd have to sell it to another person that wants to work. <laughs> so you'd have to find another employee and leave. Or maybe you could sell your cooperative share back to the other workers as long as they vote all to buy it or something, I guess. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, it would be. Please, you don't seem to know what co-op works in other countries. Curious, explain what I missed or your IP ban. Go. Destiny, I don't know where you caught that co-op thing. I worked in a co-op. If you want, we can talk about this. You don't have to buy in. If you worked for a co-op where you didn't have to buy in at all, you didn't really work for a co-op. You worked for a traditional firm and they called themselves a co-op to make you feel better about it. Like any structure that involves you working for a co-op and you don't buy in and it's like, oh, well, you're paying for it with your labor or something. You're not working a co-op. Co-op means cooperative ownership, right? So in other places like... um. Like I know Sweden does this, and I'm pretty sure other European countries do. You can have a, um, I think some people live in co-ops. Like you buy a share of the co-op to move into the apartment building, and then they allocate you one unit and you live in it, but you're living, like every single person that lives in that apartment building can be an owner of a share of the apartment building. I know they do this in Sweden. I'm sure they do this in other European countries as well, but. <clears throat> Most apartments like here, most apartments here are like that too in the Netherlands and in Canada, common in Denmark. Okay. Yeah, that's super common and a pain in the fucking ass. I mean, like it sounds cool if it appreciates in value. Listening to Melina's dad talk about it though sounded a little bit scary sometimes. Like if you wanted to improve any of the shit or like sometimes the apartment, the, the co-op could vote on like what to do with units and stuff. And if you disagree, you're just kind of shit out of luck. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, it seems like it has like pros and cons, but. In Canada, they're absolutely not common in Toronto and surrounding areas. Maybe in BC, it's different. You can buy in a membership that will allow you to have a discount, but you cannot own the cooperative. No one owns the co-op. It is managed by the employee, but no one can sell their share or buy in some share. Well, then why is it called a co-op? Who owns the co-op? It is managed by schools. I don't know what that means, but maybe there, maybe in Quebec, maybe it's like some other type of thing called like co-op. <clears throat> no one owns the co-op. It's overseen by government entities. How, how does that make it a co-op then? Can you explain that? This doesn't sound like a co-op then. It just sounds like a business owned by the government and you work as an employee. How is it a co-op? Or why would you call it a cooperative? He 
He's referring to student project cooperatives with outside businesses. That is not the system everywhere, notably in Yugoslavia. There were co-ops and market systems, but you wouldn't buy it. A co-op exists as a platonic form of a company. Destiny, I own a small coffee shop, and I call it a co-op to trick liberal college students to work here for less. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Destiny, when I read this, I feel like it's saying workers don't have to own stock or shares, but it's a co-op because workers make the majority of company decisions. Okay, here's what I don't understand. Let's say that we say that that is a thing, okay? Um... And somebody can give me examples, and maybe I'm wrong. No, I don't understand it. Ah, oh, fuck. I don't know if I want to get off onto this too much. Let's say that you have a business, and it's a worker cooperative where the employees have no equity, but they still make all the decisions, okay? Why would I ever invest in that business? Where do they get their capital from? Because let's say all the employees are like, hey, wow, look at all this profit we have left over. Let's all vote to give ourselves massive raises. Okay, wait, well, hold on. I'm investing capital. Why the fuck would I invest in you if you're not going to give me any fucking money for it? I don't understand where, if you have a cooperative where the employees don't own the equity, who owns the equity and why would that person own the equity when that person that owns the equity is not ever going to get paid for it because the workers are always going to, are not going to, why would they want to pay off an external class? It doesn't feel like a cooperative at that point. Unless you're literally just talking about like the government owning stuff. Pull chat, do you know what equity is? Did, uh, maybe, oh, wait. I guess the argument is the workers have an incentive to keep the business sustainable. I don't know if I buy that though. I wouldn't, no offense, but I wouldn't trust. And like, do you, <laughs> I'm gonna be totally honest, okay? When I was working at McDonald's or the casino, I don't give a fuck about keeping anything like that. I would just vote to give myself more money every time. Fuck that. Fuck the managers and fuck the owners. I'm not, I'm not gonna vote to give some fucking asshole in a suit more money while I'm sitting here working at a restaurant where the people next door are gambling my entire fucking student loan debt every single hand on a blackjack table. What the fuck? That, you're fucking crazy. Now, maybe other workers are better than me. Maybe I'm just a selfish loser, but um, I don't know. That's That's hard for me to imagine. But okay, never mind. I don't know. Let's keep going, I guess. It seems like Vosh isn't actually advocating for worker co ops. He wants the government to own all businesses and the workers to manage them. That's what it sounds like, Java Bolt. But that, that's not really a co op, then. That's just the government ownership of everything. But yeah. But I, I don't know. We'll find out. I think in France, for example, it's fairly normalized that there's a, a buy in to, uh, to a worker cooperative, but that's by no uh, means necessary. In either case, capital acquisition is difficult for forming worker cooperatives, but that's primarily because we live in a system where the primary means of investment for larger corporations is through the stock market, which confers, of course- Wait, what? Oh no! Wait, I don't think Vosh knows anything about the structure of businesses. The primary means of raising capital for business is absolutely not the stock market. No, that is not true. It's gonna come from private investment way before you ever get listed on like the, like, do you, I really wanna start a bakery, but I'm having a lot of trouble getting listed on the NASDAQ. So I'm not entirely sure if like, or like, I'm, you know, I'm about to go public with my company. We sold like $40 of lemonade last week. Like, yeah, you, I'm sorry, but like capital is gonna come from external investment uh, from either angel investors or some other type of investor that's buying a part of your, the company it's going to come from sba small business association administration loans uh sba loans from like banks and shit um the, yeah that's are you really this surprised wash doesn't know shit about finance well i don't know how many of my streams you watched wait hold on i'm i'm stopping him a lot okay hold on maybe i'm just not being charitable enough I, hold on let's be let's back up okay let's <laughs> my lemonade stand just got a 300 million dollar series a valuation yeah um okay let's it was because of the explosive growth, okay? We had month over month, 250% growth, okay? We're projecting 300 million buyers, okay? Depending on how well the buses run by the end of the year, okay? Okay, sorry, hold on. Let's back up and just listen, okay? I'm I just, maybe I'm not being charitable, all right? Not just investment for co-op necessary. In either case, capital acquisition is difficult for forming worker cooperatives, but that's primarily because we live in a system where the primary means of investment for larger corporations is through the stock market 
which confers, of course, not just, uh, you know, investment, but ownership and control. Um, you know, that's a choice we make. The stock market doesn't have to be that way, you know. Uh, investment in a company, worker cooperatives, can be non-controlling. Shares can just be an investment that you receive returns from if your investment is sound. Um, okay, of- this is a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, by a lot of people. Non-controlling shares, well, where's parties to rage poke? Don't most shares and most businesses give you some form of control? Now, usually I think you delegate that control to like um, other people. But if you if you own shares and businesses, like if you invest, I think even in like, if you use Vanguard or Fidelity, I think you'll get emails like every six months or every quarter, every year, like you'll get, um, you'll get emails where it's like, hey, here's like some big boring shit. If you want, you can show up to this telecom thing and vote on this. But I think most people elect to trade their votes to like some super voting body that votes on your behalf. But um, a non-controlling share is so garbage. Just, um, just think about that. Let's just, hold on, Let, okay. Finance is actually really easy, okay? It really is. I say there's somebody that doesn't know shit about finance, okay? But finance is really easy. Back up and like get rid of all the weird, complicated shit in your mind and just think about like, what would you do if you loan somebody money? What would you do for any of that, right? Think about this. Let's say that I've got a guy and he's starting a business, all right? And he's like, hey, I'm gonna start a business. Do you wanna lend me some money for that business? Um, and like whether or not you get paid back depends on the success of that business, right? There's like two ways we can do this. I can either give you a loan, in which case if I give you a loan, you need to secure this with assets or you're gonna pay a big interest rate or you need to have a really good credit, et cetera. Or let's say I'm gonna, okay, well I'll go in, but I wanna own like 10% of your company. I want some shares of your company so that when you start making money, I have like 10% of your growth or whatever. Now let's say the guy does this like, okay, sure. You can have like 10% um, and maybe he makes that same deal with like tons of other people. Maybe we'll say five other people, right? And let's say all of all six of you now are standing here and all of us own together Together, like 60% of the business, all right? <clears throat> now let's say this guy starts making decisions about the business and he's like, I think I'm gonna pay myself all the money and I'm not gonna have any extra profits for the business. Why the fuck would the six of you standing there be like, wow, well, we're all part owners of the business as well, but we have non-controlling shares, so we can't vote on anything. We don't get to make any decisions. We can't oust you as a bad CEO. We can't make any decision about how the company's run. Why would you make that type of investment in a business, right? If you're not loaning them, if they're not financing something based on debt alone, right? and you're actually buying parts of the company, what, what does it mean for you to have equity in a company if you have no control over how the company is run, right? Like, why would you, um, non-controlling and non-voting are different things? Oh, there might, there might be some differentiation, but the broader point still stands is that you want the investors of a company to have some say in how the business is run, right? Like, you don't wanna just sit there and be like, oh, okay, well, this guy's running the business of the ground, and even though we, like, own, you know, some decent percentage of it, we can't do anything about it, we're just gonna watch it happen, you know? Um, <clears throat> I think he wants them to be funded strictly by loans and workers have equity with weird ownership. Okay, so this is a second weird argument that I've heard is that some people say, we want to do co-ops, but we're going to finance the co-op with loans exclusively. You can do that, but now you just remade a capitalist business where the bank is the one that's scraping off the profits. Now, now... Now everybody is like, oh, cool. Well, we don't have to have equity or we don't have to bring a bunch of capital or whatever. But now all of our profits are being scraped off and sent to the bank in the form of interest on the loan instead of on a capital owner in the form of he owns the business, right? Like, Ownership usually involves a right to cash flows and some amount of control, right? Destiny is correct in my book. Yeah, I'm mixing up controlling and um, voting shares. Technically, I think most shares are voting shares, not controlling shares, um, to be clear. Uh, That distinction isn't as important, but to be fair. Um, Destiny, but interest payments are a fixed cost. Equity still retains the upside. Um, Potentially, yeah. But I mean, like, you're you're more or less, you're, you're still doing the same thing. Kind of like you're just, but now you've like offshored where the profits are going to some extent. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, <clears throat> a lot of the issues we have with worker cooperatives and the funding they can accrue right now is just that we've so normalized the process of selling out the democratic right of the workers at a firm that the idea of investing without getting that additional bonus is unattractive to potential investors. But that's essentially like saying, you know, we shouldn't um, we shouldn't have like workers' rights 
because, you know, countries without workers' rights are more fruitful to investment because they have to pay lower wages and don't worry about OSHA, you know. Just because we, we've built a system right now where you can get away with uh, stuff that I find reprehensible. We've set the bar low. But conceptually, all of these processes of investment um, can take place in a system where there is not a single private capital owner, where everyone simply owns a portion of the workplace uh, that they participate at, or at the very least democratically controls. You know, you can work out the, um, the difference between like controlling shares versus just like internal democratic management. But either way, what I care about principally, I think, is the, is the democratic management. You know, if workers are still getting their wages, but they have the ability to vote internally, that would satisfy my criteria for a worker cooperative. Okay, I mean, well, if that's the case, though, I think I could relatively, I mean, I think that convincingly you would just agree with my system, right? I mean, so you, you, you mentioned that you know, no one no one did an economic analysis when it turned when it came to expanding the right to vote. Um, and I agree, of course, but, I, you know, we're not, I, I'm not sure the right to vote necessarily is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how much of an economic issue that is. I, I think that when we're talking about business ownership, though, uh, naturally, this is, you know, this is more of, a, of, a, of an economic issue. Um, now, we might say that, you know, the, the consequences of giving more people, of enfranchising more people might have economic consequences because they might vote for certain economic policies. But I feel like there is probably a meaningful difference there. Um, that's kind of beside the point, though. I'm not, I'm not really interested in that analogy. It's more so that um, you, you mentioned that, you know, I, I just don't think that there's additional risk, right? You, you mentioned France, right, where people buy essentially equity in their businesses. They're not cooperatives, to be fair. Those are those are stock ownership plans. A lot of businesses have stock ownership plans for employees. I think um, I want to say that now a stock ownership plan I don't think would be the same as a co-op because you can like sell your stock and still continue to work, right? Like I don't think I wouldn't say that stock options or stock ownership is like a co-op, right? Like I wouldn't say that like are Google, Amazon, and Facebook co-ops because they get part of like I'm pretty sure they like will give you some stock or whatever as like the your total compensation of the company. Like, but I wouldn't say that any of those are co-ops, right? I think I read a stat somewhere that was like seven to ten percent of all U.S. stock is owned by, you know, basically employees that you know just buy stock of, of the of the companies they live in or the companies they work at. Um, so that already that already kind of exists in our system, um, but those aren't worker cooperatives. I think that when you when you talk about uh, the primary means of investment being the stock market, that's true and it's not true. I mean, like, you know, the, the business equity is is not it, it's 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 kind of a you, you know, it's, I'm not sure how old it is as a concept, but you say, I don't see what's so wrong about people owning a part of their business. I don't necessarily see a problem with that either. I just think that, that it should be voluntary or it should be encouraged. I'm not sure it should be required. This is where you run into these structural issues. You talk about the risk, right? Obviously it's risky when you're parking a bunch of, uh, a bunch of money, a bunch of your investment into one single asset being the ownership in a business, right? So for instance, but how is that obviously happening? there's, how does he, I don't understand. How he doesn't understand this. He, might, he I don't think he, or he has a different idea of like how co-ops work or what they are, I guess. I don't, I don't know what else to say. How it, is what happening? If you're a worker and you turn 18 and you want to go get a job, how does an all worker cooperative economy mean that your involvement in the workplace is going to entail more risk? Because you have to buy in. Because when you take a job at a worker cooperative, you're... Be, you're becoming a member of that cooperative. You're mm -hmm. a part owner of that cooperative. Um, now that ownership can either require buy-in or some sort of external you know, sourcing. Some people talk about government grants or cooperative banking or something to give people the capital in order to buy into worker cooperatives or consumer cooperatives. You're not talking about consumer cooperatives to be fair. And that's perfectly reasonable. But uh, nonetheless though, all of that investment, all of that wealth of a worker is now necessarily tied into a single business within a single industry. That's a lot more risky than like a diversified portfolio. This is why there's, uh, you know, the, the, I would say you know, this is why there's a wing of socialists that don't necessarily advocate for worker ownership, and it's more about um, social wealth funds and stuff like that, because at least an advantage of social wealth fund socialism is that the uh, investments in the means of production are diversified across an entire population instead of a single business. You can Social wealth funds, like the Norway shit? I, I always say I need to read one, I don't. They sound super fucking based. It just sounds like the best idea ever. I think that basically, broadly speaking, like... Imagine how like when you buy a mutual fund, like that mutual fund basically buys a bunch of shares from different companies all across the market. And then you own like shares of the mutual fund. And so when they make, when the market makes money, you make money. I think a social wealth fund is like a giant mutual fund that's ran by the entire country. That's ran by, or it's ran by the government and it basically pays back the country. 
like it seems awesome. So like when all of your businesses are doing well, your 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 population is doing well too. Because um, Destiny, why the fuck is the government choosing my investment slash savings rates? Uh, because most people are too stupid to do it or lack the capital to do it. I don't know. It seems like a great way. I think there's. I think it's. I like the idea that like you're you're more bought into the success of your country. Like right now. Does the average person give a fuck if Google or Facebook is super successful? No, they're not making a, a, any fucking money off that. They're not seeing a big return on that. Uh, maybe you get a better product or something. But I think the, the idea, I think, is way more cooler that like, oh, cool, like this company is really successful and like it's in my country and we all have like a social wealth fund. So we all kind of like share into the success of those companies. Um, I think it gets rid of the us versus them mentality, at least a little bit when it comes to businesses. But that, I don't know, that's how I view it. I can see how a single business investment would be a lot more risky than like a broad market index. You don't need to invest in anything. You don't need to buy in. We have co-ops, you can oh. just join them. What does he think a co-op means? Please get to this. Econo boy, you dumb fuck. Drill down, drill, start drilling. Well, we, we have, um, as, as far as I'm aware, every cooperative kind of does it differently. Um, and I'm not really sure about the cooperatives of the world, um, to be fair. I know that you mentioned France, where they're not cooperatives. Those are stock ownership plans. They absolutely do buy in. But you, as you also mentioned, it's not required to work there. You don't have to actually be a, an, an, an equity owner to, to work at those businesses. So every cooperative is different. Um, I think that with regard to the idea of just getting rid of ownership as a concept and just basically you work at a place and you just get a democratic say and then you distribute the profits either back into the business or you know back into the workers pockets if that's what they want i think that there are probably some issues with this in general i mean i think that you know on one hand um you're talking about not owning the business at that point, really, right? You have democratic say, but it's not ownership of the means of production, right? You can be fired at any time based on a democratic say. Um, the cumulative capital growth and, uh, and expansion of that business. Well, I mean, according to you, basically nobody would own it, uh -huh. right? It, it would be, a, you know, it would, it would just be like a, I don't know, it would just be a legal entity that people worked at or didn't work at, right? Yeah, absolutely. If you join a worker cooperative. Wait, but like what, who starts them? Does the government just make like 30 businesses and see if anybody fills them up? Or what does that mean? How, what does that structure look like? I, I don't need like a, um, like an exact model, but like just like roughly, like wh how does this work? Um, there would be a kind of internal share. Uh, you would, you, you know, you'd, you'd divvy it up like, like pirate booty. Um, if you had five people, it would go five ways. Ten and it would go ten ways. But um, think about what that means, Vosh. If you've got a company with five employees and then five more... Ah! <laughs> Sorry. If you've got a company worth a million dollars and you've got five employees that work there, all of you have $200,000 of equity in the company. If you sell it, it's worth 200000 If you bring on five more employees, you're diluting your equity by, by 50%. Now my $200,000 share is worth $100,000. Fuck no, you have to buy in. If you want to come and work with this company, you need to pay me $100,000 so that when my shares dilute to being worth $100,000, I'm compensated for the equity that I just lost in this company. I had 20% equity worth two hundred grand. Now you're going to dilute my equity to 10%. If you're going to cut my equity in half, you need to compensate me for the equity that I'm losing. You have to buy from the from those employees there has to be a buy-in there um, i don't i don't i don't know why you would need to buy in necessarily now ah! sorry you have you could have systems where people could buy in i'm not saying there aren't cooperatives that do that there are how do you um, compensate people for the equity that they lose how does any of the Rage made a good and correct comment. The, the, it's actually not worth anything because you can't sell it on a market. Yeah, actually, wait, that's true. How do any cooperative share? Well, maybe not, but you could buy and sell it to other people that would come and work there, no? So it would, it would have some value, right? Let's say that there's a company. No, hold on, that's not true. There would be a value there based on the revenue of the fundamentals of the company, right? Because let's say that a company was making a million dollars of revenue and they had 800,000. Well, just say easy. Company's making a million dollars in profit and it's got one employee, right? That share, if I wanted to buy into that company and, and buy half the equity from them and be a worker, it would be really expensive to do it because there's a lot of profit there. And I'm, in, I'm imagining that if you, own, if you own part of a cooperative, you're entitled to whatever percentage of equity in the revenue, assuming these are all shares of the same value and all that shit, right? So they, they would have some fundamental value for sure. Um, but I don't think it's like a, a necessary thing. If I understand the equity math once the company actually has equity, but is a buy-in necessary if you start a co-op from scratch? 
Yes, because you need to buy the capital to start the business. So if you're starting a restaurant, you've got to pay for the land, you got to pay for the building, you got to pay for all the cook equipment and everything. Like, yeah, there's going to be costs in any business. You can't start a business with no money, generally, except maybe like a lemonade stand or something. I don't know. You had like, a, for example, cooperatives Holy that shit. were just, Sorry. I mean, if cooperatives were like normalized, I mean, if this was like the predominant economic model, I, I don't think they'd be expecting like 18 year olds to just pay in like $20,000 to get their, their, their first kick. We're not talking about partnership or whatever. We're That's what co-ops are though. It's a partnership, a cooperatively owned. A co-op is just a partnership with more members, no? What? Just talking about, they would go there and, you know, after I, I imagine some brief probationary period to make sure they're not, you know, trolling, I guess, um, they would have a say in the internal vote and they would be, I imagine, entitled to some portion of annual profits distributed across. Usually- Damn, just think about that. He's never thought about this before. Those profits that they're gonna be entitled to, they're stealing that from other workers. Why would other workers be okay with them chipping in or chipping away at the profits without a buy-in? I don't understand. What, you would never hire any employees. You'd have like 10 employees working in a company earning 100,000 a year each and some other guy's like, oh, I wanna work for you. It's like, man, fuck you. You're not coming here to work, fuck. I'm not sharing my money with you. These, the workers are entitled to like a percentage of profits split across however many people there are working there. And you know, the individual pay structures vary massively according to these co-ops. But I think this entails essentially right. the same level of risk. The, you're, you're correct though, nobody really owns the, um, the, the business, which is exactly how our government works. No person owns the White House. No person owns, you know, the, the, the Capitol Hill. There are institutions that we constructed that people can work in. There are people whose job it is to work in those facilities and people who are in charge of them, but not really ownership. Um, and I think that's a respectable Oh model. God, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this tonight. I just realized we're 20 minutes into a two hour, 20 minute conversation. <sighs> because that model means that the system through which those um, institutions are regulated it can't just be the one whose name is on the deed. It has to be something more substantive than that. Obviously, our government's a shit show, so I'm not idealizing that, but I do like the fact that we have at least nominally a democracy, and I think businesses would work quite well the same, if for no other reason than because the total uh, development of the system would you know, lead to the elimination of private capital ownership, which I think is very politically necessary. Well, sure, but can you say, can you really say that you own the means of production when your ownership, when, when that's sort of, you know, when that surplus value is sort of accumulated within a distinct entity versus that's actually separated from say, the workers? Well, not say, but actually having ownership of that value increase over time. So, for instance, what I mean by that is that, you know, say that you work at a business and, uh, you know, that business goes from being worth $100,000 to $400,000. Well, under an equal ownership model that I'm describing, um, or like some sort of buy in model that I'm describing, uh, your ownership in that business, your work in that business, obviously under a reasonable framework, has increased the value of that business from 100,000 to 400,000, right? Your your wealth has you know quadrupled with regard to your investment in this business, right? But um, if the capital stock of that business, you have no right to it. Um, well, I'm not necessessarily sure if we could really call that ownership, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not ownership or in a who, capitalistic. We, 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 go, go, go. Oh, it was just, yeah, it, you get what I'm saying. I, I I truly I don't think he understands any of this. Fosh, I thought you were better than this. Fuck, he needs, it's because he stopped debating for so long. Nobody's challenged him or pushed him on any of these issues. I don't think he understands fundamentally what any of these things are or how they relate to each other or what it means to have a co-op or what it means to have equity in a business or why there might be difficulties hiring or starting a co-op or whatever. And it's funny because he's even used the talking point that I've used before that starting a co-op is can be difficult, but he doesn't he, under, he doesn't understand the reasons why. So he repeats that talking point. I think he said at the beginning, I understand it'd be difficult to start a co-op, but he doesn't know why. He's just repeating that talking point that he's heard. The reason why, yeah. Ah, oh, Jesus, sorry. Well, Right. Yeah. It's not ownership in a capitalistic method, but that's kind of the point. Um, democratic control, if you would prefer. Ownership of the means of production when used by Marx was uh, more of a class distinction. that The worker is in control, owned in the same way that you could say that the citizens of a country own their government, you know. That we don't generally say that because we're quite disillusioned with democracies, at least. We don't, we don't really own the government, though. That's not really true. We don't have equity. We can't sell or trade shares of the government. 
Ah, oh, fuck. I don't want to listen. Ah, oh, oh, shit. This is actually so painful to listen to. <laughs> We'd say- well, except maybe the Jews on the go. I don't know. Depending on who you talk to. We'll get to the next debate with uh, Richard Spencer and Mr. Girl next. If he wants to go that route. But can we sell off Guam to pay off the national debt? Yeah, Jesus. Well, this is so... ...at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I, that's the principle to me. Um, and, and there are co-ops that function this way, you know? Um, obviously, with regards to the structure of, of, of cooperatives, like who is... Um, who? legally responsible if something goes wrong or who is who? responsible for like financial matters if the business goes insolvent we have cooperatives that solve that already without having any private ownership these are usually roles you could think of it as kind of stewardship of the estate um similar as to what you would do with a house that you don't own but take care of you know you're, it's, it's yours to take care of um yours to manage but you can do all of this without relying on the capitalist model of ownership uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. I, I guess uh, we can kind of leave that there for now. I He's not going to... Well, it, it's not leave it there, but I think that I can uh, move on to something that might be a little bit more substantive. So if we're purely just talking about sort of democratizing, you know, the workplace and industry in general, um, well, then I'm, I'm not really sure how that can't necessarily be accomplished uh, actually under a capitalist framework. Now, to be fair... Under my framework, capital owners would still have that analogy doesn't work on any level. Decision in the government. Yeah, no, no. Like every every part of comparing a co-op to the government doesn't work. One, we don't own the government because we don't work in it, so it's not a co-op. Two, we don't have shares of the government. Not everybody's an equal stake. Three, we're not paid the profits on any equal level. We do vote on legislation. Four, we're not even we don't vote on how it's run. There are like owner voting people. So like the president, we don't vote on that. Like, does Vosh want a co-op that is a president? That makes decisions as one body of the co-op, like, like it, it just, it, it just, it's, it totally is just not. It's just totally just not. It's the worst analogy ever. <laughs> I, like, I don't know. Okay, sorry. We're, we're back to this. Hey, right. If you buy stock in a business, you're still going to get a vote on how that business is run, uh, to a certain extent, right? But um, I think under a model where you've got 50% worker board membership and unionization and incentives for worker cooperatives, um, yes, really not- this is the right answer. The right answer, in my opinion, and maybe we get that Kyozen guy or some other like strong union, strong unions, I think, are the answer. OK, Co- companies should be able to try to fuck over employees as much as they want to. It's part of their being as profitable as possible, which is good for the health of the company. And unions should exist to fuck over a company as much as possible. It's part of why unions should exist, to advocate for employees, to try to stick it to the uh, company as much as possible and, and represent their employees. That tension should exist. And then somewhere in the middle, we solve where everybody feels like they're getting fucked. Right. This is like ideally, I think, how it should be ran. Not sure how workers are necessarily worse off in the system, right? What's uh, what's the, you know, uh, why would it necessarily be wrong for a worker to be able to have the option to work at a business where they have, you know, fifty percent worker board membership and they're represented by a union versus a cooperative? You know, why is that? Why should that necessarily be precluded? Uh, why why should that option be precluded from them in society when it's you know a similarly democratic framework? How is it similarly democratic? Because you vote in the union, because you take a vote in your union for what types of policies the union should be advocating for on your behalf like, uh, to negotiate against the capital. Well, if you elect half of the board members and you're represented by a union, right? I, I feel like I feel like a lot of the concern of socialists is not an unreasonable concern, right? The idea that, um, you know, uh, employees or, or I'm sorry, not employees, but uh, the idea that companies to a certain extent have monopsony power, they're able to over leverage their uh, you know, their, their, their ownership in such a way that's harmful to the workers working there, either in the form of lower benefits, worse working conditions, um, less pay, right? Um, generally getting treated like shit by their, you know, you know, their bosses and stuff like that. You know, that's a reasonable concern. Um, I think that things like unionization and worker board membership can basically, you know, get rid of those concerns um, in, you know, in whole part. Um, and also, if we're talking about a system where they do have the option to work at cooperatives if they really want to, um, I don't really see why that's a system that's necessarily sort of exploitative to the workers. I don't know how half of a democracy is the same as a democracy. If you had a Congress where half of the seats were just appointed foreign ministers with no democratic involvement, you couldn't fairly say that was a democratically chosen legislator, right? I mean, in practical terms, you what? know. Uh, or, if, but, well, if, really quick, though, just to, to jump in, though. I, my... Hold on. Also, to be clear, because the is not going to push as hard as he should, Okay. In a truly democratic workplace, you're going to run into the same issues. So, for instance, let's say that I am a front of house worker and my employees are in the back of the house 
When we go to vote, we're gonna be voting against each other, right? As a front of house worker, I might say, hey, I think that when we prepare, um, when we prepare certain meals, um, they, should be put in, put, they should be put on places in a way that makes it easier for us to carry out, right? I want all this food coming out at the exact same time on my window so they don't have to worry about it, right? You might say that, and the people in the back might vote, fuck you, it's gonna come out as we make it. I'm not gonna sit here and try to coordinate across my entire kitchen, like different plates for you. That's your job, right? Anytime you're working within a place where everybody's voting, you're not all like, ah, there's so much wrong with his like, with his conceptual framework here. Not every coworker is going to be on the same page, right? There are internal struggles struggles to jobs sometimes where different coworkers are going to want different things. So you're necessarily not always going to have like people have this idea like, oh, it's going to be all the coworkers united against the bosses. Well, if it's just going to be coworkers are also the owners, they're going to be fighting against each other for different things as well, you know? Ah, uh, sorry. My value here isn't wholly democracy, right? It's it, when it comes to demo democrat democratizing the workplace. That's not necessarily a bad goal, um, but I, Would you I don't under think a that. King? What? Well, no, that's that's the next thing that I was going to say. The next sentence was that I'm not sure that sort of you know running civil civil society or sort of that social construct uh, under a democratic framework is quite the same as running a business under a democratic framework. I'm not sure if the principle necessarily should cross apply there, and that's why I'm having I'm you know I'm I'm trying to differentiate between the two. I'm not sure the analogies make as much sense. I think they're different, but. In meaningful ways, they're very similar. This may be a stupid question, but in companies where 50% or more is owned by a single person, why would anyone want to invest if that person could just pay themselves whatever because of their because they own the majority? Typically, you're going to have a responsibility to other investors not to fuck those investors over. So if you're operating your company, if you're operating your company in such a way where you're fucking over other investors by intentionally allocating more resources to yourself, you will get in legal trouble for that. That guy, that Dan from Seattle guy or whatever, that is um that that uh, bragged about paying all of employ his employees a big minimum wage or whatever, that he did that with his company. That's part of why he did it. Um, I'll keep going. All right, see you, bud. This is painful, but good luck. <laughs> have fun. In both instances, after all, you have institutions that have a huge amount of control over a person's life. The goal of systems which are larger than us is to align the interests of the people in charge of those systems with the interests of the people who must suffer the consequences of those systems. So in terms of our government, the idea of voting in representatives is that if the representatives act in our interests and do things that make us happy, we continue to vote them in. And if they don't, we vote against them. Thus, at least ideally, it's in their interest to act in our interest. And of course that doesn't fucking work, but it works better, I suppose, than the Communist Party of China would, or, you know, a comparable authoritarian government. The issue that we have with uh, economic authoritarianism is that the interests of the worker and of the owner are diametrically opposite. Uh, it is the interest of the worker to make as much money as possible and to have as much control over the place in which they work as possible. And the owners, well, the same, but for themselves. And those are opposite goals. Um, now, of course, you can ameliorate this. Uh, unions do a <laughs> little word. bit to balance out the scales of power, a situation in which corporations will naturally have more power uh. because they're an institution and a worker is just a person. But it doesn't change the fundamental relationship, which is one of antagonism. Um, I think that the, the ultimate goal of democracy isn't just uh, make number go up or even to make workers happier. It's to really align the institutions in our country with the needs of the people who work in those institutions. And a consequence that we have of not doing this is that in your case, if you had like 50% control by like shareholders, 50% by the workers, then all it would take is one worker to be bought by the shareholders for them to have essentially full control of the board. Any real decision making the shareholders are going to mostly agree on, at least relative to the workers, because the workers have diametrically opposite goals of the shareholders because they make their money in different ways. Um, they wouldn't have to buy off very many people at all for them to have essentially full control of the government. And so far, from what I can see, at least in Germany, uh, evidence has shown that partial worker control of the board doesn't really do that much to affect uh, worker involvement in the processes of the corporation. Now, I think they have 20 to 80. 50 to 50 would be more significant. I'd be interested to see any research on that. But I think principally, it's just not far enough, um, especially if you're goal, as it is with mine, the elimination of the bourgeois, the separate capital class, which can't really be done until every person in the country, or on earth, has the same relationship to the means of production. They have to make their money in the same way. Because otherwise, you have situations where very small numbers of very powerful people have diametrically opposed material interests to the rest of the country. 
you have these issues in government right now where you have all these really, really bad precedents being set, where there's a union of corporate and uh, government interests that lead to, well, it leads to something, but often it doesn't lead to stuff that's in the interest of the people necessarily. Wow. I feel ameliorated. Yeah, I think that, you know, you, you, you say something that's interesting, you know, in, in meaningful ways, they're the same. Um, you know, the, the idea of a, you know, sort of a civic government versus the way you're governed at a corporation. Um, but also in meaningful ways, they're different, right? Um, you, you mentioned the idea that, you know, if we have representatives, we vote against them. That's a good thing. Well, obviously, you could say the exact same thing with a worker uh, board or a, or a union, right? Unions are oftentimes democratically run to a certain extent. There's union elections, right? You have union representatives. Um, you have union presidents uh, oftentimes. I'm not sure of any unions that operate any differently, um, to be fair. Um, obviously, when a union goes on a strike, for instance, that's something that has to be voted on by the union members, the workers, um, stuff like that, right? And so, you know, to me, this this sort of optional representation exists under my system as well. The, the difference is that I think my system is just generally uh, more efficient, and ultimately, again, I think we I have to keep going back to that. You know, some what workers would just efficient? prefer. Well, I think that you know you get rid. Uh, you, I think it's more of a uh, balancing act. I would say, right? So I think that uh, there's generally been fairly favorable results when governments uh, have to work with uh, different sort of corporate boards and stuff. You know, negotiating process. And I think there's also good sort of results, and there's good evidence to say that when a union negotiates with a uh, company oftentimes they're, they they generally tend to meet in the middle and have you know end up getting better benefits and pay and stuff like that and I think that similarly if you're unsatisfied with your union representation you can elect new ones and if you're unsatisfied with your worker board rep representation you can also elect new ones um, you mentioned that uh, well because I think capital investment is a you know has a reasonable seat at the table if they offer that investment in the first place and uh, you know the the uh, the managers or you know the, the the current owners or who you know whoever is running that business in the first place agrees to that investment. I think it's a fine thing for a company to say, hey, we're taking your money and this money comes with it some sort of actionable decision making capacity. Now, to be fair, a shareholder ultimately like what's the ultimate authority that a shareholder has over a business? Well, um, you know it's it's the board membership elections in the first place. That's like the most direct authority that a shareholder has over. Uh, a corporation. For instance, if you bought Shell stock tomorrow, um, you can't just walk into Shell headquarters and act like you're the owner of the place. Technically, you are, right? But really, your ownership typically just confers a vote on the uh, on the board, right? And the influence thereof. And I think that giving that same exact influence over to, um, you know, all the all the influence that we would be scared of uh, from a socialist perspective, right? That business owners are, um, you know, exerting their influence in the form of these board elections. Well, we're just giving the exact same um, sort of influence over to workers, and, and I think scared. that makes for we're not scared more valuable, of power, uh, paradigm. only who has it. We're not afraid That's what of I'm saying. the idea yeah. of people having that decision-making power. Um, a couple of things. No, no, First no, no all, that, that, that's not what I'm saying. No, 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 so really quickly, that, that's not what I'm saying, though. What I'm saying is that the effects of that ownership is really you know, necessarily the thing that is worrisome under a socialist framework, right? I'm just saying that those, those same powers can be transferred to workers, um, and they would necessarily have a better seat at the negotiating table. I had, I had two more quick points. Um, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, Germany has 80-20. Um, as far as I'm aware, Germany also has 50-50. Uh, um, it's 50-50 for, like, big businesses, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then they go from there. Boards are actually relatively small. So, you know, if a corporate board is, like, eight people, you know, it's it's not the most bureaucratic nightmare to, to elect uh, another eight people to that board, just be, you know, worker representatives. Um, you mentioned the idea that it would only take one worker to be swayed by the shareholders. Well, similarly, it would only take one shareholder to be uh, or only one like shareholder elected board member to be swayed by uh, you know the the workers or the more activist shareholders, which is you know can happen under today's framework and has happened under uh, today's framework. Um, and the last thing you mentioned was that you know I, I think this is maybe a, a way we can take it as well is that the interests of workers and owners are fundamentally opposed. Um, I would say the same thing about all trade uh, relationships, right? The interests of like True. the United States and Canada are fundamentally opposed when you're talking about negotiating a trade deal. Or you could even say intra-country. You could say the relationship between different industries might be opposed, right? People that sell um, people that sell combs to barbers probably want to sell those combs for as much as possible. Barbers want to get them for the lowest, right? There's a there's a tension that exists, I think, in all economic transactions, right? A buyer wants to buy something for the least amount possible. A seller wants to sell something for the most amount possible. This is always going to be the case, probably. Um, now, we could frame it that way, but I think that there is a joint interest there, and that that joint interest can create sort of net value, right? That plug and play, and, and or, or give and take, I should say, 
between like Canada and America is very valuable. And I think similarly, there's a lot of value created when there is a give and take between like a union and a corporation. That's why um, it doesn't tend to be the case that you know workers that are represented by unions tend to be worse or less productive. Um, but it does tend to be the case that uh, despite those companies being able to maintain their profits and efficiency, um, it, it does tend to be the case that workers uh, feel more satisfied. They get more benefits. They get more wages. And I think a similar sort of more, uh, I would analyze it more like a trading relationship than just, you know, uh, oh, you have diametrically opposed interests. And I think that that, that, uh, that lens of analysis is probably more useful when looking at uh, policy and, and these types of relationships in the first place. A couple of things. A couple of things. I think it's really odd that you would claim that it's more efficient to promote unions, which are just an extension of the antagonistic interests of the working class relative to the business owners. What? When unions are nothing more than a facsimile for the fact that owners don't have control itself. It, this is one of the issues I have and you don't seem to understand. 50-50 isn't enough. Shareholders can have zero control. You say like, well, there's a chance that what workers could sway over one shareholder. I don't care. I don't want to live in a government where 50% of the legislator is foreign appointed officials and we have to just sway one of them. That's not acceptable to me. It's the well, I wonder, does he not realize that in his even in the idealized form of whatever he's advocating for, there's going to be tension between the workers themselves? Vosh himself said that not every worker would receive the same compensation. Well, when you go to vote for who gets what money, what do you think is going to happen? Of course, people are going to fight on who on, on paying everything. Democracy or it's not. In terms of efficiency, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that direct worker control is inefficient. In fact, it seems to cut at the problem immediately by directly addressing the interior antagonisms, the power relationship between the workers and the owners having diametrically opposite interests. That antagonism the doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Like, But interested in seeing how in a system with full capital investiture relegated to worker cooperatives you know non-controlling shares and what have you uh, how effectively something like that could be implemented because I think there are a lot of inefficiencies in traditional autocratic ownership just as autocracies are inefficient in almost every large institution whether you're talking about mercantile corporations or dictatorial states kingdoms whatever um, authoritarianism tends to carry with it a number of inefficiencies uh, for a great many reasons, an in unfamiliarity with the work being done at the ground level, um, and a, a lack of sympathy towards the interests of those beneath you, um, the consumption of um, ideology uh, on the part of the capital owners, which leads to them doing disastrous things out of some, I guess what you'd call uh, buying your own hype, like when the Sears guy um, it turned his uh, turned his businesses into that like ANCAP paradise and everything failed, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't, um, I think it's, it's democracy or, 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 or bust really, um, w with regards to capital ownership necessarily conferring control, I don't see why it should. Um, the bank after all, doesn't get to control a house just because they signed off in the loan for it. Now, of course, if you can't pay your, you know, pay your, pay your payments back, then, um, you can foreclose and the, the, the house can go to them. Um, but in terms of management of the house, uh, while it is yours to control, the bank gets no say. I don't know why buying into or investing into something should necessarily confer um, any control over how that institution is run. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, with regards to the trade relationship analogy, I think that trade is fine when you're talking about two institutions of equal institutional power leveraging out things between them. But I don't think it works as well when it's institutions which control a great many people trying to fight with those people from what they can get. I mean, we see this in government, for example. We certainly don't have, at least ideally, an adversarial relationship um, with everything our government does. Like, we, Good luck, ideally, Tabor. the interests should be aligned because the better our lives are, the more productive we are and the more likely we are to vote in people who probably want to stay in there for a second, third, fourth, fifth term. Um, uniting the interests is efficiency. It is efficient to cut through those middlemen. Um, and I just, I, I don't I don't see the issue with full worker control. The last point that I want to make is um, you ask yeah. why, what if, what's wrong with the worker wanting to work at a more traditionally managed business? Um, and my answer to that would be, I don't care. Uh, in the United States, you can't sign yourself into indentured servitude nor slavery. Um, and I'm fine with that.
I think that people in, uh, there are plenty of economic situations where people can be forced into, Jesus. Uh, even if it's for their immediate benefit, conferring their freedom upon a system which does not owe it. And uh, I think that's a bad thing. I think it's okay to categorically prohibit anti-democratic. Oh my God. Jesus. Yeah, sure. Um, so... Yeah, sure. <laughs> he needs to be more hardcore uh... of these. <laughs> he doesn't even know what to say. <laughs> just writing some stuff down. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. So I guess I just, I just, you know, to go one by one on these, you know, you mentioned that you know, unions are nothing more than a representation that, you know, capitalists don't have all the power, right, as a counterbalance to that because the consequences of that would be bad. Sort of, you know, I'm, I'm almost begging the question by saying that I'm in favor of, you know, union uh, uh, m membership or, or worker board representation. Um, not necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly open with saying that I think that democratic structures, whether it be through unions or worker board membership, are a good thing, right? Um, you know, you, you, for instance, you mentioned the idea that authoritarianism is inefficient. Uh, you have a lack of sympathy. You know, there's a local knowledge problem there. Um, these things are solved by the structures that I advocate for. Um, you know, it, that, that goes into the idea that you mentioned that, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? There's no evidence that uh, worker ownership is necessarily inefficient. Um, what there is evidence of is that the efficiency gains and the, producti the productivity gains of, you know, worker uh, cooperatives are not necessarily homogenous. You know, every study that I've looked at with regard to uh, worker-owned businesses or, you know, employee-managed businesses and their relative productivity or profitability or, you know, whatever have you, um, pretty much often, I, I've never seen a study that doesn't tend to say that, um, are, you know, these results were not homogenous across industries. Some industries did better than others. Um, what I found consistently in the data was remarkable inconsistency with how well uh, worker enterprises did, um, which isn't to say that they're bad. It's just to say that depending on when the study was done, depending on where the study was done, um, and depending on the uh, the industries that were looked at, um, worker uh, managed businesses tended to do um, better and worse depending on all three of those factors. Um, for instance, in the Italian, the, the, the... What is the point of this convo if Washington sees he doesn't care if the system is better for the workers under the goal is to abolish the bourgeois? Shouldn't the conversation be about whether or not getting rid of the bourgeois is beneficial? Yeah, kind of. It's really weird. We kind of missed that point in the debate, but it's kind of weird that Vosh immediately conceded that point um, and said that he's just interested in like his ideological purity versus actually improving the material conditions of workers. That that was kind of a weird concession by him, but I didn't really push on it. And it seems like a kind of boy didn't either because there's it's, it's probably not much there for that discussion, but... Northern uh, Italian region. Yeah, not to mention, like, oh, God, the killer question would have been, how do you square away your ideological commitment here to getting rid of the bourgeois versus improving the material conditions of workers when you constantly talk about how much of a utilitarian you are, Vosh? That would be a really good question. Uh, Emilia Romagna, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, where uh, a huge portion of the economy is cooperatively managed and, and organized. Um, it's still only about 10% of workers that work for cooperatives. These are mostly producer cooperatives, which means they're having the agricultural industry. Um, and then most every other businesses, uh, business is, is, uh, is not cooperatively run. That's, that's in one of the most incentivized sort of culturally favorable environments for cooperatives. And so I think that the, you know, the idea that this would necessarily um, you know, lead to efficiency gains, I'm sure is, is, is a bit dubious, especially when it's mandated. I think that you'd end up in a system where you're incentivizing them you'd end up in a system where worker cooperatives sort themselves into the industries that they do, that they do best in. Um, and I think that that's probably better, um, not just for the economy, obviously, but you know, generally for everyone, right? That you know, when, when the economy is efficient, it's, it's generally better for everyone, especially under a democratic framework where a lot of those gains are, are redistributed in the first place. Um, next, you know, the next couple things you mentioned that um, banks, banks don't get a say in how uh, you, like your house is run because they lent you money. Um, well, well, obviously this is a debt market, not an ownership market, right? So I mean, you you agreed to lend me money. You didn't agree to sell me the, uh, you know the, the 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 you know the the ownership in the house necessarily, right? I own the house. You just gave me the money to buy it, right? That's why there's a difference there. Um, if you're talking about you know well, um, you could raise capital just through debt in a uh, worker cooperative society or non-voting shares. I think that there's probably some some capital formation problems there. Raising capital is a really powerful tool for. The economy, and I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a system where you're either primarily reliant on banks or entirely reliant on banks, I think is probably a system worse than we have now. Um, yep. You mentioned that because now the banks trade, are the big playmakers in society. You know, it's not good to have. 
you know, an entirely adversarial relationship, right? But I think that you can absolutely have this in, uh, you know, a, a trade agreements with uh, different nations, right? You no, know, you know, so nations trade with each other when they do have entirely adversarial interests, right? Despite the fact that we have an entirely adversarial relationship with China, um, we do still trade with them quite a lot, despite all the terrorists and stuff that have been, you know, engaged in. I wouldn't say that trade itself is bad. I might just say that that particular relationship is bad and probably warrants some sort of endogenous or exogenous force, right? Similarly to how I could agree that many workplaces are bad, um, but I wouldn't say that it's like the relationship itself that is inherently the problem. And I'd make the exact same argument with trade. Um, you mentioned the last thing you mentioned was that, you know, in the US, you can't sign yourself up for uh, slavery or for indentured servitude. Um, I, I just have to reject the analogy in general here. I've seen socialists say this a lot. I don't think that I don't think working at, like, I don't think getting a job at, like, you know, a, you know Starbucks or, or something, Starbucks. I don't think that that's the same as being, like, a chattel slave or being an indentured servant. Um, and, and I'm not even, I don't even think you'd necessarily say that they are the same. You're just drawing an analogy. I just think the analogy is so off base here that, it, that it's, it's hard to really reconcile with. Um, Damn. And also, to be fair, um, you know, you, you, you can indeed in America work uh, for free, right? But you still have the same rights as any worker. Um, it's called an internship, right? You can also volunteer your time um, and, and, and things like that. Um, Don't that's worry. not to say that we'll make those illegal too. <laughs> yeah, sure. But I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, the, the analogy I think breaks down fundamentally. And I think that um, ultimately it's, it's sort of emblematic of the lack of flexibility. You know, internships aren't necessarily the worst thing in the world, um, you know, to, to, to offer people to do. Um, I, you know, you and I both have probably known many people who have springboarded successful careers based off of internships they were able to get when they were younger. Um, and I don't think that that is necessarily the worst thing. Um, but I also don't think it's anywhere close to being a slave. They are the same. It's a continuation of a historical form. Uh, types of labor which deny autonomy to the working class. It was more explicit under slavery and under indentured servitude, and you could get away with that. And there are plenty of places that still have slavery and indentured servitude, of course, we're not done with that. But here in the United States, you know, we have, at least for now, done away with those forms. But there's an underlying insidious nature to these systems which goes beyond just the explicit brutality of slavery. It is the fact that in those systems, mm -hmm. as is the case with this system that we live in now, yeah. as a class, there is a political consequence to the denial of democratic rights. It goes beyond just being able to rearrange your Starbucks, you know, um, uh, uh, like counter the way you want, or getting a little bit of extra money because you're entitled to a portion of profits. Uh, it means that when it comes to the people in this country who have the most power, and make the most important decisions. They are overwhelmingly not workers. In a real democracy, this would not be the case because a worker and an owner or a member of the bourgeois have very different economic interests, very, very different. They make money in different ways. They benefit from different policies. They have an interest in different kinds of investment, different kinds of tax structures. These are incredibly important policy-based differences uh, that will affect their reasoning over ours. And the issue is they're not just in government, of course. They obviously, by definition, run the corporations, and they overwhelmingly run and present at news media. This isn't conspiratorial, I hope. It's just true. It's what they do. Um, and for that reason, um, essentially all political fuck? narrative making, all uh, messaging that we get, broadly, in this country and oh, in so every other capitalist country, is filtered through the lens of bourgeois interest through their capital interest, through their class interest. Um, and the political consequences of this are very real. My support of worker democracy goes well beyond I think people should be happier in their workplace. The issue is that as the way things stand right now, there are groups with different interests and the group who has the other set of interests controls everything. We are not similar to the bourgeois. They do not share our interests. We have more in common. And I say we as though I'm a member of the working class as a live streamer, but let's just pretend for a moment that I'm speaking on behalf yeah. of the working well, class. Well, te technically you are, right? I te technically, but in terms of I material. I mean, you're, you're part of the proletariat. Well, I, I don't... Well, Wait, I what? Hold on. Member, but let's just, we have more in common. And I say we as though I'm a member of the working class as a live streamer, but let's just pretend for a moment that I'm speaking on behalf yeah. of the working well, class. Well, te technically you are, right? I te technically, but in terms of material, I mean, you're, you're part of the proletariat. Well, I, I don't. Well, I guess you're not because you own a, a business. Maybe, maybe you wouldn't. Maybe I should. I wonder if you would be what, what, for a streamer. 
I'm pretty sure streamer would be part of the working class. There was a uh, there was a term. I don't know if Marx made this term or if it came after Marx, but there was a term for like the managerial class that came up because there, people noticed that it was kind of weird that you have these workers, like these lawyers and dentists and stuff, and it's like, well, these guys make a lot of money, but they seem a little bit different than the working class, and I think they called them the uh, the petite bourgeois was um was the term uh, that they came up for these people. So they, they're not like the owner class, but they make so much money, they, they, it, like, they put some a little bit separate than like a normal, um, than just a normal worker. Shouldn't say no, that, I don't I, even have that what registered. I'm yeah, let's, let, let's say uh, that I, as a, you know, you're in a gray um, area. Petite yeah, sure. bourgeois, labor oh, aristocrat, um, live streamer. I think I would have more in common with a, you know, Taiwanese worker than Elon Musk. In terms of material interest and what policies I would want. That's probably not true though, Vosh. You'd probably have, you, our interests are gonna align more with working class people, especially people like electricians or plumbers, people that do contract work, than with the owner class. Because people that are advocating for smaller personal income taxes, for smaller self-employment taxes, so a lot of contractors or plumbers or whatever, people that work out of their own business, 1099 workers like Uber, and these people, materially policy-wise, you and I are gonna align with them more so than like a business owner that's looking at getting like a bunch of like capital raising exemptions, like capital gains tax or other forms of like business tax exemptions. He doesn't, sorry, fuck. He doesn't know anything about what he talks about. It triggers the fuck out of me, but whatever. Went passed for my government at the very least. So I think it's critical to think of things that Stop way. Stop dropping the R in bourgeois. It's bourgeois. It's a bastardized imitation of the French pronunciation, which includes the R. Bourgeois? Is it, I thought it was bourgeois. The bourgeois, bourgeoisie. Bourgeois, bourgeois? I don't know. It's one of those words. I don't know. Okay. When leftists talk about wage slavery, democracy, and all this, it sounds heady and, you know, uh, self important and uh, over exaggerated. But, you know, one of the big reasons why we're facing down the barrel of a climate crisis is because the media institutions in this country and others are largely put forward by people who are good friends with barons in the coal and oil industry, as are a lot of politicians. So the system we're in right now, I mean, we're staring down a couple billion deaths in a few decades. I mean, I think we're talking about the political divide here, you know, between people who can build survival yachts and people who cannot is going to become increasingly significant as time goes on, which is the reason why I don't even care to respond to your earlier points about non-homogenous efficiency industry to industry. The economy can shrink for all I care. I think that it won't. Jesus. I think that the evidence we have for worker cooperatives is largely earnest and optimistic. I want more evidence on this, of course. I want things to be implemented carefully and effectively. But even if things went down for a bit, much as the same way that I supported the American Revolution, even though that did lead to an immediate decrease in the economic productivity. How of does this square away this utilitarian uh, I think there's something so materially confused. useful there that's difficult to put into a GDP chart. Sure, okay. Um, I think that yeah, I understand what you're saying. I mean, if you if you want to concede that, well, not concede, but if you want to, not I don't want to say that frames it unfairly. If, if you want to say that basically it's irrelevant to me that the, the potential economic consequences of what I'm saying, um, that's fair enough. I mean, I understand that we you know we make moral decisions in economics all the time, right? Um, you know, we don't uh, we don't allow you know uh, we don't allow eight year olds to work at coal mines, right? Uh, because we've decided that. Yeah, that's we just that's just not okay. But right. Given, um, now, to be fair, to, yeah, just go to be on, clear, sorry. Given the current info, I don't think there would be severe economic consequences. It's possible no, that some yeah. industries would be. Right. I just I want to say that that's not the thing I'm hung up on. But I don't want to uh, give the impression that the evidence suggests there would be this, you know, like economic sure. catastrophe. Yeah, and that's why I, I rephrased myself because I don't want to give the impression that you are giving that impression either. I would just say that with regard to the. Um, we, we, you know, la last point, I suppose, on the more economic side of the debate, I would just say that, um, and, and you might even agree with this, I would just say that the, the economy would be more productive um, if we had incentivized co-ops that can sort themselves out versus mandated co-ops. Um, now, obviously, to, you know, to, my, uh, to my point, I, I couldn't tell you how much less productive. I could just say that pr with relative confidence that it would just be less productive than otherwise would. Um, now, I would say that that's bad because it doesn't allow you to redistribute as much. Um, you know, consumer uh, prices probably go up. People might have less discretionary income. I think there's a lot of extrapolative effects from there that would be quite negative for society. Um, but to be fair, without putting a number on it, you know, uh, you did say to be fair that if it, would, it, was, it was just truly so bad for the economy, you'd probably move off of your position. But I can't say how bad it is. Um, so we can probably just 
leave it there. Um, with regard to the more sort of we'll um, okay. almost philosophical points, um, with regard to the more sort of philosophical points, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, you know there's political consequences to being denied uh, these sort of voting rights uh, in your company. Um, to be fair. Um, I might agree to a certain extent. That's why I'm in favor of democratic structures in the workplace. I'm just not in favor of this strict democratic structure for all those economic reasons. Um, you say that uh, people make the, you know, people making the real decisions are not the working class; it's the bourgeois. Um, but I'm not actually sure how true this is, right? Um, it seems to me, based on my sort of survey of of the literature and what I've done, um, the the median voter, you know, the people that vote, tend to actually be fairly well this represented. Is true. Now we might say that, um, well, the the median voter is disproportionately you could say just different in general from the sort of average working class person. And I might agree to that uh, to a certain extent. I I'm not sure exactly how true that is. I'd have to look at the statistics, but um, that's just to say that our democratic system works, right? And I would say that with regard to policy, I think people tend to get the policy. Vosh's chat is probably so mad at this. Vote. Works for whom? For. Can I interject um, that very has been briefly? No. Yeah, go for it. Where are these people educated on those policies from? Well, they're educated in Marxist universities, Vosh. But where are they really educated from? <laughs> I'm not sure. You have to. You're, you're talking about the news media or whatever. I, I was going to actually talk about that next. Okay. We. This is manufacturing consent. Manufacturing the idea that people. Yeah. Oh, so, man. for example, people in China broadly support their government. People in Nazi Germany broadly supported their government. People support what they're told. Bosch the knows better than everybody else. Hegemonies He's here to tell you what you should really want and in desire. In the United States, a you know the great America, um, the American exceptionalist capitalist country that you know straddles the world, um, we are presented information uh, in a, in a narrativized manner, um, and I and I do think that influences what people think they ought to vote for. You know, a lack of class consciousness. Yeah, I think, yeah, so exactly. And this goes on to what I was about to say. I could tell you were kind of getting at the manufacturing consent issue. I think it's a valuable thing to bring up because it's a good point. Um, but it's a good it's a good narrative, I would say, by Chomsky and, and, and Herman, uh, the, 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 the oft-forgot second author of, of manufacturing consent. But I, I think, I think that, who did more work for the book than Chomsky, to be fair. Not to take anything from Chomsky. Chomsky's done a lot of work. The issue is that at least from, from my reading of manufacturing consent, all the actual fundamental conditions of manufacturing consent would actually still exist in uh, a market socialist system. It's just that the, uh, the, 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 the interests shift from... Oh my God, Econoboy bring up all the based points. Who's to say that in a market socialist economy, some industry still wouldn't be putting out propaganda to uh, change the way that certain people vote? They absolutely could. Uh, you could say from like capital owners to just the worker owners, right? So, for instance, Chomsky and Herman talk about you know mass media adhering to owner demands. Well, obviously these owners still exist. It's yep. just the workers instead of. Oh uh, no, Fosh is like fuck! I didn't actually read manufacturing consent. I just got the clip notes. Uh, you know, instead of capital owners, it's not to say that they wouldn't have their unique interests that might be at the detriment uh, of society. Um, you know, they, they talk about, uh, they link this in with the idea of the role of advertising dollars, how, you know, advertising campaigns and advertising dollars uh, heavily influence what we see and what we're told, um, and that this is a toxic relationship. Obviously, advertising cooperatives would still have all Except, the same incentives yep. True. under a market socialist system. They talk about the, the powerful bottleneck and, 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 and gatekeep uh, that mass media uh, uses to control the narrative that you know the the powerful basically prevent you from being able to write stories because they have access to the powerful people. Well, um, you know th this this sort of lobbying effort would just shift from capital owners to uh, worker owners. There's no reason why you know worker cooperatives wouldn't have their own special interests that they would lobby uh, the government on behalf of. Um, mm -hmm. They talk about flack. You know the idea that you can get sued for reporting something that's considered controversial. Um, well, again, you know, if you report something controversial about a huge cooperative, I can see why you might be scared of being sued by that huge cooperative, despite the fact that you're a cooperative and they're a cooperative. Um, and the last thing uh, that I that I found from uh, the book was that uh, they, they talk about, um, you know, anti-communism or the war on terror as a means of uh, social control, right? Well, all this sort of mass hysteria and government apparatuses could certainly still exist under a market socialist uh, system. You know, you, you, you talk about how, uh, in general, that this relationship is is necessarily toxic, but all of these same sort of fundamental structures would uh, almost necessarily exist under under you know under a market socialist system. And the last thing that I would say is that um, you talk about you know uh, oh, no. people supporting what they're told, right? The the the, the, the just the, the core of manufacturing. This guy is giving me an aneurysm. It's almost like market socialism is a stepping stone, and those decisions 
would be made democratically within the cooperative, meaning you'd have to get a fuck ton of people to agree with it, which by itself works as a dampening effect on a lot of the shit, the exploitation you're talking about. Would it, though? Consent, right? People believe what they're told on the news media. Um, but I think that there's some issues with this narrative. One is that um, it's pretty hard for news media to have like a, like a ubiquitously true narrative, right? I mean, look at the... People do it all the time, obviously. Mass media courses your first day. You might learn about how you know, CNN and Fox News reporting on the same exact story are going to have totally different... Uh, lenses of analysis. And this is true with regard to um, pretty much every issue. Um, it's not quite a homogenous media landscape. Um, yeah, see, Econo Boy is, <laughs> is being a cuck and he's taking the ultra good faith approach. What he should have just said is, well, I actually think that consent can be manufactured in a society run by co-ops. And then he should have shut the fuck up and then seen how Vosh responded from there. That's what he should have done. That would have been the Giga Chad based move. But Now, you might say it's homogenous in the term of supporting capital owners, but I'm really not sure what that means in this regard. I mean, obviously, there's progressive news media networks. Um, there's, you know, progressive shows. There's right-wing shows that are very anti- sort of corporate. Um, you know, uh, obviously, we, you know, the the, 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 the very, very anti-big business Tucker Carlson, right? Uh, even though he's obviously a, you know, big, bit of a crazy guy. But you, you get what I'm saying, though, that I, I just don't, I don't really buy the argument that while at the same time, these, these capital owners are truly controlling everything and truly manufacturing consent, um, it seems like they're quite bad at it um, because it seems like all the you know most of the systems we've implemented uh, with regard to sort of social spending and, and and worker rights and stuff like that have been fairly robust over time. It seems like they can't really get a, quite a homogenous narrative on the news media. And to be fair, all the problems associated with that um, would still exist under a market socialist system. So a few points. Um, yep. With regards to, hmm, okay. Um, Go for it. You're correct in saying that the leaders of worker cooperatives would continue to act in and lobby for their material interests. No, not the leaders of the co-ops, because the co-ops wouldn't necessarily have leaders. You're talking about democratic structures. All of the incentives would shift to each and every worker rather than just being on the boss. But there's a critical distinction there, actually several, the largest of which okay. is that they would be advocating solely for their business, not for the bourgeois as a class. The issue right now is that the shareholders and CEOs of every corporation on Earth fundamentally share essentially the same relationship to their governments and the policies that they want passed. Because the ultra-wealthy who make their money off the back of other laborers uh, work, um, they share a lot of uh, characteristics in common. Obviously, wealth is one of them. The way in which they make their money, the way in which they tend to be taxed, those are big ones. Um, but the, more critically, they're insulated from the material interests of the working class and of the poor. Meaning that, or to put it another way, um, if in a worker cooperative society you had, you know, cooperative Exxon, who um, found evidence of climate change in the 1970s, lied about it, burned the papers, and then, you know, denied, denied, denied. Um, I think there's a huge difference between them doing so individually as a cooperative solely in favor of their own interest, their own selfish desire to pre preserve their company, as opposed to uh, them working in tandem with the broader business class, which is exactly what happened, you know? If you take a look right now at how these narratives are promoted, it's not just the coal industry fights for the coal industry. It's the wealthy as a group, not in totality, but at least in significant enough numbers that it becomes more than just Exxon doing this. Is that really the case, though? Like, I'm a pretty wealthy person. I'm imagining other pretty wealthy people. Like, why the fuck would we care? I feel like poor people would want Exxon to succeed more than wealthy people would. If we think about how, like, energy affects our life, I don't give a fuck about my energy costs. Like, if gas costs $10 a gallon tomorrow, it's not going to bother me. If my electricity costs go up, you know, 2x, I don't care. I feel like a working class person is going to be way more bought into the success of this than, like, w like owner class people. stuff uh they act in unison they have class consciousness yeah especially because like i'm pretty sure i feel like generally the wealthier you are the more left-leaning you are on a lot of these like climate change related issues i don't know I, we'd have to need like see the polling data or whatever but um they fall in line because at the end of the day the systems that allow exxon to keep power 
are the systems that allow essentially the rest of them to keep power. None of them want regulation. None of them want the federal government looking too closely into how their businesses run. None of them want the EPA to have more power than they already do, because the EPA's power is always going to be to the detriment, or at least overwhelmingly so, of these corporations. It goes beyond the interest just of this company and turns into a broader class-based interest. I think transparency would also be a big one. In a uh, authoritarian firm, let's take again Exxon, if they wanted to do research on climate change, uh, you know, burn the documents, uh, oh, climate change isn't real, lie, lie, lie. In an authoritarian firm, you can get away with that. Tell everyone involved in the process that their ass is grass if they come out with it, and that's that. You know, it's internal corporate research. There's no legal, like, whatever. They, you get to keep, hey, enjoy your $300,000 a year job in the, in the Cayman Islands. You know, have fun. Just don't ever talk about this. In a democratically run business, of course, the millions of people who work directly or indirectly for this company might be really negatively affected by the idea of ending the world, which would affect them directly because they can't afford the yacht palaces that the wealthy people who run an authoritarian corporation might be able to transparency is a necessary component of democracy and for that reason that means not only do you have more potential for whistleblowers you also have more potential for dissident within the institution itself and any ceo or any head leader or whatever of you know democratically controlled exxon would quickly find themselves out of a job if it was found out by the hundreds of thousands of people who worked beneath them uh that they were bringing the planet to a state which would soon lead to uh the the flooding of the places that they currently live in uh, i know that sounds a bit idealistic but I genuinely believe that would be the case absent the Stop. decades of misinformation. Here's like the two things that I feel like you are against. And it's hard because we're talking like we're so idealistic in all our arguments here. But like, couldn't you argue now that it's better for one owner of Exxon to be incentivized for Exxon to destroy the environment than all of the workers? Because if all of the workers are incentivized, don't, don't they all now? Aren't they all like, okay, well, you know what? I didn't like the bullshit before where you were making money destroying it, but you know what? Now that we're all kind of making money off it, I don't know, right? Couldn't you argue that now all of the workers of that co-op would have the same incentive to be environmentally destructive to protect their jobs, similar to how unions in the United States are kind of incentivized to be against like the Green New Deal and shit because they don't want to lose their jobs? And then also, couldn't you also argue that in the same environment, wouldn't other co-ops be incentivized to work against that co-op? Like, couldn't a green energy co-op try to expose them or say like, hey, this is fucked up or hey, this place is destroying the planet or whatever? Like, I, I don't know, I just... I feel like there are other things at play here potentially, but information that we've seen concerning climate change. And if you don't think they can push narratives when they need to, a third of Americans don't believe in climate change. Like that is insane. There's no reason to not believe in climate change. It's like a 100 to 0 issue. It's very straightforward. But because of a dedicated media campaign, uh, over decades, not only is this like a big subject of debate, but the media here, campaign will still be there from that co-op, no? Federally, because the Republican Party is principally against any kind of climate change uh, action, because the Senate is always going to be disproportionately rural voted and thus red. So now, what was originally one company lying turned into the media in bed with that company promoting disinfo turned into an entire political party opposing any action on the subject, which will, as we'll find out in a few decades. Uh, end most human life so i think this is direct in a few decades and most human life lead down <sighs> okay is this has anybody watched all of this is the rest of this worth watching dream of the lack of transparency and the lack of oversight and the lack of control uh working class people have over these big institutions it's kind of loopy towards the end how long is it, Mr. Girl Talk? Because I have to be done by 10 tonight, so. I don't think I'm actually mining these crystals from anywhere. Somebody told me that you're not supposed to use them to build things because you'll run out. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going to build some of these dank ass miners. Is that okay? Solutions. Um. Which is why you see whistleblowing a lot more commonly in democratic governments as opposed to authoritarian governments. Any system where you give more leeway for the common people to second guess, to double check, to see what's really happening, you get more opportunities to have these big conspiracies or big problems like busted wide open, you know? Um, so that's, so would cooperative ownership fix lobbying and corporate interest? It absolutely would not. But I think there are ways in which it would be meaningfully 
different. And those are the main ways. Wow. So the main, so just to get it clear, the main ways would be transparency and maybe I missed the first way. Well, what's like the distinct two things besides trans, what's the other thing besides transparency? Oh, Tran the, the class itself, right? Transparency, oversight, and they could only ever lobby in favor of their business, not in favor of themselves as a, as an economic class, as the bourgeois. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, so, yeah, okay. So I, I think I can respond to each of these. So, um, you know, you, you, you talk about, you know, they, they'd only be arguing in favor of their business, not but not the sort of bourgeois as a class, right? But I, I would say that there'd still be distinct class interests um, in in this society, right? I mean, obviously we would, we you know, I, you're, you're, m most socialists aren't of the persuasion anymore, the idea that everyone would be truly equal, right? Or, or Nor the idea that everyone would have like some sort of perfect distribution or flat management uh, of their cooperative, right? So there'd still be managerial classes under your system, and there would still be a material interest uh, differentiating many different people depending on where they worked, uh, what kind of cooperative they worked at, um, and 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 you know, frankly, just where they grew up, obviously, just their own political persuasion, right? There'd still be distinct class interests that could have toxic effects on uh, you know the sort of political orientation of local politics and perhaps have an outsized influence or perhaps even a uh, you know just a straight up negative influence on national politics. So I think that that's still, uh, would exist. You use the example of, you know, cooperative, you know, cooperative Exxon uh, might have still destroyed the evidence for climate change, but we wouldn't have seen any sort of broader apparatus of action as a result of this. I really don't see why not, right? If every oil company was a cooperative, um, there's no reason to think why the cooperative oil companies of the day wouldn't have the same exact material interest to destroy that evidence uh, and go from there. Um, this kind of leads into your idea that, you know, none of the bourgeois wants, uh, uh, you know, EPA regulations, uh, worker safety regulations, regulations in general, um, to which I would just say, uh, well, obviously, uh, you, you know, the same types of cooperatives wouldn't have this, you know, they, they'd have the, the exact same incentive structure uh, to not want those things as well. If you're a cooperative uh, who, for instance, relies heavily on contracted labor, um, you, you know, maybe you're contracting from a cooperative, but you're still just incentivized to not want, uh, you, you know, worker regulations uh, or, yep. you know, safety this regulations, things like that. You're, you're oh, still, God, thank you. Oh, this is like all of the, <laughs> I can't do it because none of these fucking losers will talk to me, but it kind of always bring up all of the, this is all true. All of the same things, um, all of the same things that exist in a capitalist society right now that cause people to vote in certain ways, these would exist in, in any co-op society as well, right? You don't like the way that contract labor is is treated? Well, guess what? If I have a co-op where I, um, you know, I make buildings, I'm probably going to contract labor from another co-op that does like construction materials and I want to fuck them over as much as any capitalist owner would, you know? just incentivized to destroy the environment and not want the EPA, um, the material interest still exists. Moving on to your, your, your transparency point, um, I'm not really sure that this is necessarily true, right? We're assuming that every... Um, work yes. Notice. Yes. The big issue is the problem here, and this is what I said. This is what I said. Okay. Um, This is why I said this and Vosh's community got mad at me and they made fun of me and they said I was an idiot. Market socialists are just capitalists, guys. Market socialists, they want all the benefits of capitalism, but somehow they want to retain all of the upsides with socialism. I don't know why. Like that's that's what they that's what they are. Market socialists are just lazy capitalists. They don't want to actually put any thought into like any of their um in, into anything that they do. They just want to like try to have the best of all worlds. Because the issue is that all of the issues all of the problems that you run into with a capitalist structure in terms of voting for different things or having different interests that might be contrary to the rest of the population, all of these will exist in, um, in, a, in a market socialist society as well. All of the same malincentives or perverse incentives, all of the same things are there, exactly the same issues. And it kind of always bringing these up one and one and one and one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worker cooperatives is a, is a flat, um, pure... Uh, sort of pure democracy, um, which I'm not sure we would reasonably assume, especially if, if it's true that worker cooperatives could actually be big, right? When you see uh, like Mondragon, for instance, which is sort of the classic example of large scale cooperative organization, um, they have a representative democracy and only, you know, 29, 30% of their 
uh, employees or actually members of their cooperative because it has such a problem uh, with scaling. But that's more of an economic point, and, and we're, we're, we're kind of uh, we're, we're kind of moving on uh, from there. But that's just to say that obviously the upper management of Mondragon would would certainly be able to um, relatively easily uh, keep secrets from uh, you know the, the 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 sort of lower, more entry level, or perhaps uh, you know just the, the, the workers who aren't involved in the representative yep. council of democracy. I'm not sure why we would expect necessarily that worker cooperatives would be more transparent, uh, even internally, uh, than than regular old. Uh, businesses. You're right that you know you, you, I would probably be willing to concede that um, they're probably more internally uh, transparent. Um, but just because we have a transparent, uh, relatively transparent democracy in most every country, you know, every country still has intelligence uh, agencies. They still have secrets that they keep for national security reasons. And I think similarly, you know, you you, you pull back the Exxon uh, example uh, here, which is to say that if the workers of, of, of worker cooperative Exxon found out that their managers, which they'd be more likely to find out um, that their managers are, are hiding this information from the public, they would fire their managers for trying to keep this a secret. I actually don't agree at all with this. I don't think they'd be uh, likely to, to fire them at all. There might be some sort of sanctions. There might be a suspension. Um, but I don't think that, that material interest fundamentally changes. Um, I don't think that they would be there would be some uproar that would cause worker cooperative Exxon to be more environmentally conscious. No, not at all. Um, this leads into your last point, which is the idea that there's no um, there, there's no reason not to believe in climate change. I agree that there's no scientific reason. I certainly agree with that. And I think that's probably what you meant to say. But there's absolutely a material reason for people not to believe in climate change. You know, for instance, um, you yep. know, the, the material interest of coal workers. Yep. Right? They're, they're, they're oh, incentivized thank you. Oh, my God. We got a DGG in here. <laughs> to take this seriously, not to believe in it. Um, and they're incentivized because um, yeah, because of the huge moral hazard that exists with regard to pollution and, and sort of environmental degradation in general, right? Environmental degradation that's caused by a select group of people is never going to only hurt that select group of people. So while they're profiting from environmental degradation, everyone else is sort of spreading across um, that, uh, you know, that, that harm. And if anything, they might be disproportionately uh, not hurt by it. You know, for instance, they might be wealthy enough to build seawalls or wealthy enough to move to areas that aren't low lying and not flooded. Right. So there's, there's all of these dynamics at play that would actually lead, uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, to, to a society with regard to the information dissemination of climate change not being fundamentally different um, uh, th then today. I'm not sure that those numbers would actually change at all. All the same things exist under your system. The material interest causes all of these things to exist, and that fundamental material interest is not uh, not uh, by by any means, in my opinion, really significantly addressed. I'll give you half. I'll, I'll give you half a point on the transparency thing. That's probably true, um, but I really don't think it would lead to uh, a, a, a far different outcome. And, and the last thing that I would say is that. I'm not sure that we would even necessarily expect a far different outcome from, or in terms of the transparency, in terms of all the, you know, the, the class interests and all that stuff. I don't really think we'd expect a far different outcome from my system, which is unionization and worker board membership, right? When you've got workers representing half of all boards, you'd probably get all the same transparency benefits. But like yep. I said, I'm not sure we can necessarily kick ourselves out of the material interests. I think that what that requires is a broad and a deep democratic uh, structure nationally, yes. uh, which is what we have now. And to be fair, uh, which is shown to be, uh, fairly robust, right? We still have the EPA environmental regulations that tend to get better and better over time. We're cutting emissions, right? So, uh, you know, I think that that broad democratic structure in our government is really what solves those sort of individual material interests, not actually transforming our economy into a worker uh, sort of cooperative oriented economy. First of all, EPA regulations have been getting gutted, and their most recent gutting was because a member of the bourgeois who had a material incentive to oppose EPA regulations was put in charge with the EPA. Wrong! That person was supported by over half the voters in the United States. Trump was enacting the will of the people. You think that all these Republicans in the United States are in favor of more EPA regulations and Trump was acting contrary to their interests? Trump, the democracy in the United States still draws its power from the people, believe it or not. You're just upset that a lot of those people disagree with you for how the government should be ran. Ah, oh, fuck. It's such a waste of time. So... Yeah, I, I mean, I I wish it was getting better with time. Um, also, how can you say that it's not getting better with time? Didn't we, we the big, I only know this, I repeat this time because I studied so much for some debate that I never actually fucking had. There were three huge pipelines that were in the works in the United States. All three of them got axed. The Keystone XL pipeline did, or at least the expansion plan for it. And then there were two in the Northeast region that got destroyed, that got axed as well. And literally it came contrary to all of the corporate interests. It just came because of like massive protests and widespread unapproval in the United States. Um, I could go back and look at it. It was like, was it the Atlantic pipeline? The, what were the, what were the three ones? There were like, how can you say there's no progress being made um, in the Kanto region? <laughs>
alt-right pipeline. Unfortunately, the communist pipeline is still there, but... <sighs> Destiny doesn't actually understand Vosh's argument. He knows that half the country would vote against this stuff. Well, sure, but a little bit more voted for Trump, my dude. That's the whole point of a democracy. Like... <clears throat> I mean, unless, I mean, we could have a different talk about, like, the Electoral College or something, maybe, but. They could do a lot better. I think that one of the issues I have here is because I often feel like, I often feel yeah. like opposition to the, the glorious worker social, uh, 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 you know, um, market socialist society that I advocate for. Um, it, it Sometimes it's presented as like a policy thing, but I think it's it's actually quite ideological. I disagree with you on a lot of these things here. Yeah. Well, the, I feel like, well, to be fair though, let, let me uh, just jump in there. I, I feel like I did, I, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't a very empirical response, right? I did give a fairly ideological sort of, you know, teasing it out type response. You know, I, I'm talking about material interests and things like that. I, you know, I'm not quoting any data when I, when I give that response, right? No, no, of course, of course. And when it comes to stuff like this, it's difficult too, but I feel like there's it's it's the ideology again with regards to like material interest coal miners would still argue against climate change when we take a look at people who oppose or who don't believe in climate change in the u.s we're I think talking that pointing about that trump wouldn't have won because of the ec i guess if you want to go into that conversation topic next but people who do so because they watch fox news not because they're like coal miners or oil rig workers. Fuck, this is fucking boring. Okay, I'll be back in then. I think we're just going to switch to the Mr. Girl one. Well, it's maybe something else spicy. There's a difference be between not believing in climate change and not thinking we should do anything about it. If the argument was really about whether or not we should do anything about it, then that would be what they would promote over Fox News or whatever.